Hey folks, welcome! I, I cannot believe there's so many of you in the chat already. This never happens. Uh, this is clearly <laughs> the effect of my guest tonight. Yes, cheers for joining us for our top 10-ish <laughs> thematic Euros. This is definitely a, t a, ch a list I've been wanting to do for quite some time, mainly because thematic Euros are kind of my jam. Not to say I don't like any dryness or beige Euro ever, but you know they're, they're, they're more an exception to the rule than something I go for mad. But, of course, you know, I got to bring on somebody else who loves a good Euro. I'm not sure <laughs> what, his, uh, what, what his intentions are on theme. We'll find out soon, I guess. But uh, I finally got Paul Grogan to actually be available for the channel. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. All about that. And uh, no, no rushing off to the hospital tonight. <laughs> yeah, no, first of it. No, oh, don't Yet. fix it now. No. <laughs> I don't want to tempt fate. No, no, you're staying here. You've got, we got you yeah. booked. That's why I've actually got people in the chat for a change, you know, it's because you're <laughs> here. So as that works. But before we get started, just in case you are one of the, what, like the 0.5% of people who doesn't know who Paul is, this is your chance to tell everybody who you are. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you very much to everybody for watching this live and hello to everybody who's watching this back afterwards. <laughs> My name is Paul Grogan. Uh, I've worked full time in the board game industry now for about seven years. Prior to that, I've been a gamer my entire life. So I'm um, you know, not just somebody who started working in the industry and then started playing games. I've been playing games since the 80s. Uh, the work that I do, I do rule book writing and editing. Uh, I do um, some tutorial videos. I do playthrough videos. But alongside my paid work, I also, like Luke, run my own Patreon campaign, uh, which funds a lot of uh, non-sponsored playthroughs on the channel. So yeah, Luke is looking through the, uh, the, the channel now. And you can see that there's a mix there of, of videos that were sponsored, but also... I think it's probably like 80% of videos now are not sponsored on the channel and they're, they're supported through Patreon. So yeah, do lots of content. And in terms of uh, like rule books, particularly with games I've got behind me, <laughs> that's kind of your jam in a sense. It's like if, if, if anyone's got a heavy Euro, there's a good yeah. possibility you owe Paul for being able to actually understand it in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I mean, I do a lot of rule books, but the heavy Euros or the medium to heavy Euros um, are probably the ones I specialize in just because they're the kind of games that i play anyway um and those rule books do tend to be harder to write so yeah i wish i could do more um but you know only one person so know the feeling all too well on that front <laughs> yeah but but yeah there are definitely a few lacerda's mind clashes and some other games where it's kind of like right i don't know if i want to read this rule but oh there's a vid that's all yes. good <laughs> you know imperium was actually a pretty good excuse recently actually you did a solo playthrough on that one I it's did. just like oh, i'm not sure this rule book's particularly good uh paul give me a hand you know that was... <laughs> yeah even, even though i got the setup wrong and i had the ai deck the wrong way around but yeah apart from that <laughs> it was fine <laughs> ah. Minor, minor quibbles, that's no big yeah. deal. The fact that both of the designers and the developer was watching the video live and nobody nobody pointed it out during the live stream. There you go. <laughs> that, that, that's me uh, passing the book. Well, they were, they were going there, but we've got plenty of enough people around. Hello to James. Hello to Mark. Hello to Peter. Hello, uh, this is going to take me forever to go through everybody here. Hello to Jim. Hello to Rick. Uh, hello to Lillian. To Gnome. Jade Dauber. Lone Jedi. David. God, yeah, blimey, there is a lot here. And of there course, Mark. There is, of course, Mark and, and, a, Aaron, and a fellow Southwest. Devon. Whereabouts mm. in Devon? That's what I want to know. Because today, as a completely side topic, today I had a message through on Instagram which basically said, Do you live in Columpton? That was the message I got. But it <laughs> turns out to, yeah. <laughs> there's a couple who live just a few miles away from me that are into yeah. the same sorts of games that I'm in. They had no idea who I was and the fact that I lived in Columpton. I'm literally down the road. And then I saw their collection on BGG and the kind of games they post about, and it's all the same kind of games I like. Well, you got some more so, gaming yeah, buddies Yeah, that then. came out of the blue. <laughs> well, so. I don't know what with that, but yeah, he's in Newton Abbott. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, i got friends in Newton Abbott, so. So not too far. Myself, I mean, I'm not down the West Country currently, but, you know, most of my life through Somerset, so, but then where my parents used to live, our family house was basically about 30 minutes down the road because it was just like yeah. exit, exit Taunton and then go south and there's Columpton. That's yep. pretty straightforward. Well, not we've got our own junction. We're not that small. <laughs> True. <but laughs> yeah. don't, don't come I mean, off the M5 at Taunton. Stay on the M5 <laughs> and come off at Columpton. Uh, you'll know if you've come off the M5 at Taunton because you won't be able to move. Exactly. You'll be sat there for an hour waiting at uh, Creech Castle 
crossroads yeah yeah all the roundabouts before it yeah it is crazy so yeah this time we have got top 10 thematic euros which is basically an invite for the like the worst potential for getting definitions wrong or interpretation <laughs> subjective viewpoints <laughs> ever because we got two words in this already we've already got thematic and we've also I mean, got euros euro yeah. yeah which one are we going to start defining first should we define euro first yeah because that's the hard one <laughs> Now, if you look, I mean, I did a podcast about three years ago with um, uh, with Matt and Tom Heath, uh, Creaking Shelves and Slicker Drips, where we basically defined what a euro was. Um, I, I haven't gone back and listened to it now, but my, my thoughts on it are probably the same because Board Game Geek actually has a definition of what a euro game is. It has these six bullet points, or it used to have. Um, and what one of the really interesting ones on there was the name of the designer is on the box. So that has become the running joke for the last three or four years that if the name of the designer is on the box, it's a euro, and if it, if there isn't, that it's not. Now that that's that's complete nonsense. Um, I was going to say was I, just, I was just about I was just looking at the Arkham Horror and like fantasy flight section. It's yeah, like, yeah, come yeah. On, no, hang on a minute. <laughs> it, it was a funny. The rest of the definitions were generally okay, but that one we always found a little bit funny. So for me, um, you a, a euro game, and and to be honest, the the net, the term euro means that. This style of games originated in Germany, right? But mm. we are 20, 25 years on from these definitions. You get Euro style games now designed all around the world. Mm. And at the other end of the scale, which is the American style game, is also a nonsense term because you get American style games designed all over the world. And in fact, a lot of the early uh, 80s games from Games Workshop UK were the absolute epitome of what you would now class as an American style game, Talisman and, and, and things like that. So a lot of those games started out in the UK, but that's that's the sort of scale. And at the Euro end of the scale, I generally speaking here, because there are some exceptions to the rule, generally low player interaction. When there is player interaction, it isn't direct. There isn't there isn't like conflict or attacking people. Yeah. Um there isn't generally that there is generally a lower look factor and lower random element. Yeah. Uh, you will have input randomness rather than output randomness. So classic example, dice drafting games, a whole bunch of dice are rolled and then players will choose the dice. The randomness is mm. done beforehand. Whereas a lot of the games at the other end of the spectrum are, I'm going to try and attack the troll. I'll roll a bunch of dice to see whether it yeah. works or not. So very loose definitions mm. it does get a little bit blurred when you start throwing in bag building though that's always been the, the one that yeah. scuppered euro sometimes yeah 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 because that's like input and output randomness at the end of the day like yeah. i've i played a game recently called bastille a queen game and it's like everything mm -hmm. in it is entirely stra strategic based i'm going to place my thing here i'll get this card i can look through this deck great except for this random little bit of bag building that's in there which right. can swing things a lot and it's just why is that in there that doesn't make yeah. <laughs> any well, sense that's the other thing as well, is there are very few games now which are at complete ends of the spectrum. I mean, I have in yeah. my collection, I have a few games which are 100% Euro. They are yeah. multiplayer solitaire. There's no player interaction whatsoever. There's no randomness. It's all pure Euro mechanisms. I also have games in my collection which are completely at the other end of the scale, mm. where it's very high randomness, be it cards, dice, or whatever. There's lots of fighting. There's lots of conflict. But... 90% of my collection is what is now termed as a hybrid game, which yeah. is somewhere in the yeah. middle. And it, it's, you know, it's, I can't now say that's a Euro game and that's an American style game mm. because most games are hybrid. I say it's towards that end of the scale or it's towards that end of the scale. Yeah, we've, um, we've, no, lo we've no longer got the extremes anymore. Hybrids now coming yeah. in and just blurred things like crazy and it's we just have to basically say look it's more this than it is this and sometimes yeah. it is down to interpretation it's not going to be a diehard definition and the, you know me the last thing i'll do is trust a statement on board game geek to tell me what a definition <laughs> of something is so it's like it's, yeah. it's it's just one of those things and i'm sh I, I would feel confident that of the 20 games we mentioned or less so if we cross over and that we're not going to have a problem saying look this was actually a euro game yeah. Um, I mean, there was one that I think we did mention, which sometimes does come into contention, but I'm sticking to my guns on it. So okay. <laughs> we'll get to that one later. So that's the hard one out of the way. For Matic, that's got to be a lot easier, surely. Well, it was easier <laughs> because I, I have my own definition of thematic. 
Uh, and one of the things that I would like to say when I, b- before we start defining or what I'm <laughs> going to define as thematic is a lot of people have the scale Euro to American style game. They don't like that. So they have it Euro to thematic on the same scale. Yeah. If you are one of those people, then I'm not going to say you're wrong, but <laughs> you're wrong. Um, and that is because <laughs> whether a game is thematic or not, is a completely different scale to whether it is a Euro style game or an American style game. Yeah, um, well, otherwise this, this wouldn't work. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. But a lot of people have that because they don't want to use the term a merry thrash or a merry trash. So they use the term of the, they use the term thematic. And the reason why I don't use that and why I think it's wrong is that because Euro games can be thematic. So for, mm. for, for me, thematic until about two weeks ago was the game the mechanisms of the game and the things that you do in the game work and are how it would be in real life like you would use brick to build a building and the Mm. bigger the building the more brick it costs and the longer it takes and therefore you have to pay the contractors more money to build the things like that where you where you've got mechanisms within the game that you go oh yeah yeah I, i i can understand why that rule is there it isn't just spend three blue cubes and gain two points and move one track one piece or one track and yeah. what's that what's that track called oh it's called the research track what does that do oh it gives you points at the end of the game right no that's yeah. not <laughs> thing. that's just random resources for random points but when the mechanisms actually fit with the game then that mm-hmm. for me is is my first definition of thematic yeah and second one on my front i mean that all of that is agreeable yes the second one it's also got to be a bit more a sense personal i guess perhaps in the way that you like when you feel when you play the game it's not necessarily oh yeah you know, there are a couple of games possibly even one on my list where you might think well hang on that bit of the game that mechanic isn't technically how it works in real life and it's like yeah, yeah. but when you're playing it you still kind of feel in that mood of you know you're, you're making yes. references to the the ip or the theme it's doing you're p- possibly even you know eating or drinking what the game's like actually themed about or something yeah. but it puts you in that mood or yeah. mindset and yes that could it, you may just be leveling up a couple of tracks in a sense but the rest of it still has to flow although yeah funny that we mentioned like you know pushing cubes up tracks because that was effectively <laughs> the dictionary definition of a euro in the old days yeah, wasn't it yeah, it's like yeah, cubes yeah. on tracks and yeah or in, or in my case with you know a couple of friends of mine the term beige euro is now yep. a thing where it's not just euro it's beige as if that's kind of like the upper scale of yep. what a, a true euro is, is or, like, or a soulless euro is, is the other the, is the other term where you're not engaged with the theme of the game whatsoever all you're doing <laughs> is manipulating resources and going onto spaces and moving things up track with the whole intent and purposes of, of gaining as many points as you can get yeah, but there's no draw to the game. You don't feel like you're a farmer in you know Middle Eastern Europe or or, or whatever. So um, one of my uh, one of my patron supporters, Peter, told me about something that Reiner Knizia said about Tigris and Euphrates. Mm-hmm. Now, unless Tigris and Euphrates is is on your list, because we don't know each other's lists, but Tigris and Euphrates for me is an abstract game, but. The good doctor, Rainer Knizia, was trying to convince people that it was thematic in in your in oh. this second definition of thematic, because the game represents the rise and fall of growing empires and, and how that all works. So, yeah, it's an abstract tile placement game with absolutely no thematic mechanisms in the game, I don't think, except yeah. that the feel of the game does kind of represent that so again that is the other definition of theme mm, that's a that's the one that i probably wouldn't go as strong on i mean i like tigers and euphrates although i've got the yellow and yangtze one now or something oh it's yeah my, my slight preferred of the two it's like pick your poison really but yeah. you know if i'm playing it i i get the idea of what like setting it's trying to do but as i'm mm-hmm. placing tiles out i'm like yeah i'm putting green next to green red next to red putting yeah. them token over here or something so like that theme doesn't draw out it, it may work as a setting but it's like it, you gotta like show you've almost got to like pull like pull at it hard to try and get any out there or you gotta yeah. like ring that stone a little bit in order yeah. to don't worry that's not bits. on my list nah, but <laughs> there's no way i would ever say that was a thematic <laughs> game 
Yeah, well, who knows? I <laughs> say I know what's in your collection, but I know, but I'm sure your theme's not too bad. So before we get started, Paul has told me that because he need well, I came up with a list of ten. And granted, yeah. don't take the ranking too strong here, guys. All right, because I've, I've I've tried to rank it on the kind of balance of do I enjoy it and how thematic I think it is. But you know, you could probably swap them out every now and again because yeah. the short list was long to say the least. But I still did it myself. Paul on the, Paul on the other hand had to get I help. Can't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I need help, so I, I asked for help from my patron supporters um, because I was able to come up with a few myself. Um, but I'm I'm terrible at putting together top 10 lists. I get a lot of anxiety over deciding what to put in there and everything else. So a lot of my patron supporters voted. Thank you very much to all of you who voted on your favorite thematic games. Uh, and there was one that appeared like six or seven times, but I've not played it. So it's not on my top 10 list because I haven't played it, but because so many people voted for it and said it was their favorite thematic game, I felt that it deserved a mention. And that is Obsession. So Luke, have you played it? I have not because no. it's impossible to find, although <laughs> it's getting annoyed everybody's sort of going on about it. I want I will play it and find out how thematic it is, but let's just say Jane Austen books like Pride and Prejudice. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, my history with that in GCSE English or something is not positive. You know, right. when you're forced <laughs> to not only read the book out loud but also watch the six hour TV serial, or whatever it was, you kind right. of hate Pride and Prejudice after that. And the fact that this game is basically that is like, oh whoa. You're, you're having flashbacks. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's it's it, yeah, it's PDSD. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just read a few comments that they said. Is basically they said that it's basically like playing Downton Abbey, the board game. Uh, the yeah. Victorian era really shines through. You invite guests. They augment your reputation. You build your estate. You recruit servants, which have different abilities. Basically, they, they've they all said the same thing, is that you actually feel that you're running this estate in, in the Victorian era. And it, it's just like, as you say, a Jane Austen novel, Downton Abbey, everything else. So I've got, I've got to take their word for it, because as I say, it wasn't just yeah. one or two people. It was about six or seven people that, that voted for an Obsession. So what do you think in the chat? If you've, uh, if you've played Obsession, would you class it as, as thematic? Um, if not, uh, why not? So far, I think people are kind of on that uh, front. Uh, we've got a sort of random question here. I'm not, we're not like really taking on questions per se, but I mean, do you prefer a certain mechanic in a thematic Euro game I don't know. It, it, it depends. I mean, some of my favorite Euro mechanics actually don't lend themselves well to theme anyway. I mean, deck building Correct. is one of my favorite mechanics. Yeah. You don't tend to find it in a thematic game other than in one or two very rare cases. No. No. But, you know. Yeah, deck building is a mechanism. I, I, I think you'd, you'd find it quite difficult to actually apply a thematic reason for deck building, except yeah. Baseball Highlights 2045. Okay. Which I'm kind of works. Moment, yeah. <laughs> kind of works. That, that, well, I mean, yeah. that, that could pro that could possibly work. Uh, I'm sort of looking at some of the Euro games, particularly ones I've mentioned. And it's kind of like I mean, worker placements are the, the easiest one because you can pretty much turn any setting and that into a worker placement game, and some will do better than others on that front. Yeah. Area control is probably the next easiest one to do, but yeah. I mean, deck building and bag building and even dice mm. placement can be very tricky to make thematic because yeah. it is very much a mechanical thing in the sense. Yeah, I don't know. Obsessions at one that, like I said, when it actually becomes available to see and find again, or perhaps I think maybe my friends have got it, or and I think I got sent a link to play it online. So this is one of those ones where I've just got to find a time to play it. All right. Me too. Okay. Fair right, we're done with honorable mentions then. So right, you've been waiting for it, people. <laughs> Ted, Here we how go. much how much crossover do you reckon? I got. That's a got good to... question. Yeah. I, get everybody right now who's watching this. How many crossovers do you think that me and Luke have? We've each got our own list yeah. of 10. We've not shared it with each other. How many crossovers do you think we have? Mm. We'll, we'll, give everybody a, we'll give everybody a minute to, to come up with a number uh, or write it <laughs> down and the, the winner gets 10 gaming rules points. There you That's go. The I, I mean, we may differ on some of the euros we like, but there's got to be ones we agree on a theme. I've, I mean, I'm going to be slightly prudent though and go three, be. three myself. Do you think three? I'm thinking three. I'm th right. I'm going to look through my list again. You're <laughs> going to, you're going to, when I mention number seven, you're going to pretend that you've gone under a tunnel and you're going to disconnect me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, oh, I'm going to say two. Okay. I think we're only going to cross over on two. No, Tid. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the chat is saying basically two, three, or four. Uh, Jerome is saying zero. <laughs> I, I would have... We're not going to cross over. There's a lot of people who would probably think that we're not going to cross over at all. Or so, although to be fair, most of the chat are probably just saying how many will Luke get wrong is this thing. And it's like <laughs> it's not so much. I don't think as much as we might not necessarily gel on the games. I think it's hard for us to say that I'm just going to get them flat wrong. I mean, I'm pretty certain that they're either Fomatic or Euro. But we'll yeah, see. we disagree on a lot of things about games. Mm. But I think we're going to agree on whether a game is a Euro or not and whether yeah. it's thematic or not. Yeah. And like, in a fun like we, way. We've had the discussion beforehand <laughs> that two of my favourite games, I have already told you, they are not on this list because I will, I will say that they are not thematic in any way and they're yeah. my favourite games. So, yeah. There's those ones. All right. Well, fair enough. Okay. A, all right. Whoop. Where have I got comments on there? You get 10 points. Well, we'll see. <laughs> see how many points how many points we all get. So, let's kick off. And they've even broken out the local stuff again. <laughs> right, who's going As first? Always, always the guest first. You start okay. us off. <laughs> so, like Luke said, I have 10 and I have tried to rank them in order of 1 to 10. Um, but it's not, you know, this was a very, very loose thing. So anyway, yeah. number 10 on my list is Agricola, designed by Uwe Rosenberg, published by Lookout Games, came out in, I can't remember, but I can tell you this, a little bit of a story about Agricola. I've been going to Essen for about 20 years now. The year that Agricola came out, it was only available in German. Because it was a bit of a, a risk, it was this big new game with hundreds of cards, it didn't come out in English when it was first released. Um, because I was fascinated by it, I bought a German copy at the Essen that it came out. I'm yeah. one of the people that helped to do the English text and the paste-ups on BGG, which I then printed out, and I played my English copy for a year, uh, my english fied copy for a year, until the next year at Essen, when Lookout Games basically said, everybody who bought it in German, come back, give us your German deck as proof that you bought it, and we'll give you an English deck. Um, so yeah, I was there when it when it came out, and it was only in German. And a lot of this game is thematic. Now I'm not saying the entire game is thematic, which is why for me it's down at number ten, because it feels like you are struggling on this farm. Uh, you're preparing the fields, you plant stuff which grows, you then harvest it. Uh, the cost uh, of everything you do, I mentioned earlier on about the cost of building buildings. It uses the right resources. You know, you can either build the, the roof with reeds or you can build it with this. It's, it's all there. All of the improvements that you get in the game, all of the occupations, mm -hmm. they all do what you think you would do. If you decide to build a wheelbarrow, that the effect of the wheelbarrow has the effect in the game that you think that a wheelbarrow would have. However, and the reason why I've got it down at number 10 is there are some parts of the game which definitely aren't thematic. The worker placement mechanism here works for spaces where the resources are being collected because if there's a pile of wood and I go and get that wood, then I'm sorry, Luke, the wood is yeah. gone, okay? However, if I decide to send Mr. and Mrs. off into the house to have a baby, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can't because yeah. I've used that worker <laughs> placement space. And that's where worker placement sometimes comes undone and that is one of the downsides of Agricola for me is that, well, wait a minute, I've, I've built my house. I've got, a, I've got a spare bedroom ready for the kids, yeah. but I can't <laughs> do the thing tonight because another player has used the worker placement space. And that, that, that kind of breaks, breaks it a little bit for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, like Stone Age had the thing with the uh, aforementioned like Love Hut, as they call yeah, it. Or something. Yeah. But at least that's just a light game and it's not trying to be too thematic. Um, Agricola definitely fits for a thematic game. I'm surprised it's actually yeah. as, as low as it is for your like your personal list. For that baby thing, yeah, is kind of one thing that like rubs me the wrong way because it's so important to get more workers are like, absolutely it, it, critical. It, and yet absolutely. you've only got one space to do it. Yeah. And you could sort of be blocked out for like the whole time. Yeah. But then also, I'm not sure if, like thematically i sort of get the idea that at the end of the game you're penalized for not having everything so that like, you've got like if you have if you're missing one carrot you lose points but, i don't I mean, know that's... whether there's a thematic reason for that but psychologically when you give somebody negative points if they don't do something from a game development point of view it makes people want to do it even more 
So I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up on a farm in the Middle Ages. Um, it could have been that every farm, in order to do well, needed to have a bit of everything. If yeah. that's the case, if that is thematically the case, then even the scoring is thematic, um, which is good. Going back to Stone Age, though, the reason why in Stone Age there is only one love hut in Stone Age. It's one village, that, and you're all playing in the same village. Whereas in Agricola, you each have your own farm. Yeah. So, yeah. How about that? But was that the bedroom is a resource. <laughs> so it's <that's> not, <laughs> not my book it in. <laughs> it's just that yeah. bit that exists. Alrighty, cool. So my number 10, most of the games, I think all the games I own out of the ones that I, yeah, every single one I own, this is the only one I don't. A friend of mine does. I don't play it mm -hmm. very often. So I figured I'll put it as 10 for that reason but i cannot say like oh this isn't thematic because this just represents uh collecting a card game perfectly which is millennium blades uh right. whoop, but i don't want the uh ticker version what's going on there get yeah, that but that's better always those but yeah millennium blades like i say i don't go mad for the game seven out of ten time but i do enjoy playing it every now and again it's just like it's got too much in it for me that want to own it and try and teach it to people mm -hmm. so i'm waiting for the specific thing but this one has you kind of doing two phases your first phase is a timed phase where you are frantically chucking in bundles of cash with little <laughs> ribbons around it in order to collect the cards so it's like you've got it, I mean, it's just like, oh, one money in a sense. But because it's a lot of little bits of paper money wrapped around, it does feel like you're chucking away your life savings, which let's face it, that's what everyone did in the, in their teenage years playing Magic. And I should know probably university times playing Magic. It was a bit like that. And then once you've done with the time phase, the second part is actually playing the game in the first place. So you've got these cards. Now you've got to actually play what the CCG is about and try and do well in the tournament per se. So it's... A nightmare to kind of learn and teach. It's got a lot going on in it, but you know, you want to play. It's got one of the most unique themes out there, and that certainly helps it to stand out. Mm -hmm. But just that whole frantic time phase of going, you know, I, I'm I'm good now. I've got the blue. I've got that hero I want, but I could do laundry next week. Give me that yellow. Give me that yellow. So I want it. And it's just it just completely captures that theme really well. It's just maybe like not one that I, I tend to play often. Yeah, I've heard a lot of good things about Millennium Blades and being a, a CCG player myself, um, mm. more so in the, in the 90s than, than now, um, I've been told it really captures the feeling of, as you say, throwing money at cards to try and buy the best cards to build your deck and everything else. Mm. Um, I've, no, I, as I've not actually played it myself, but you're saying that the second phase of the game, do you actually play like a CCG game then with the cards that you've bought? And essentially, yeah, the CCG bit has its own rule set for like, right. oh, you, I, you like, you've got a, a player board there with the cards and you lay them out in such a way. It's been a while since I've mm -hmm. played it, but utilizing what the cards do, like stat wise, you're trying to effectively like win a kind of tug of war thing with the opponents. Right. Uh, but it's just the idea that, you know, it's not just simply, oh, I'm collecting random cards that are worth so many points. No, it's collecting cards that I actually want to use in the next part of the game. Right. And as, um, like Miran is sort of quoting, I'd still think it's a Euro game because there is no dice chucking uh, from what I remember. You are still, you know, gaining victory points. It is still like not necessarily luck of the draw, like you've got the cards, you can now use them. So okay. I would say like the, the randomness isn't quite as strong as, you know, some other games. Right. Um, yes, it's got that timed element, but I don't think a, a timed phase would kick it out of the Euro category. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I... I... Again, it's it's your own personal definition of a euro. From the little I know about the game, I wouldn't have classed it as a euro, but hmm. it's on your list, so that's fine. Well, that's why it's a ten as well. There's a, there's, yeah. there's multiple reasons why it's kind of like, hmm, does it count in that? So I'll put it on ten. Yeah, <laughs> like just in case that if anyone does get on my case, it's not as high as it could have been. Yeah. Ho hopefully there won't be any more on the list that go that round. All right, moving on to nine. Okay. No, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Oh, that, your turn now, is it? <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, it's my number nine, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Um, get him. Bas <laughs> basically, from people who think it should be higher. Okay. Uh, and this is Kanban, or Kanban EV, Vital Lacerda, Eagle Griffin Games. Um, a lot of people have got this as, like, the, the most thematic Lacerda game uh, and are going to be... Quite surprised that I put it down there in number nine. Um, 
there is a, there is a lot about this game which has the feeling of working in a car factory. It has the different departments. It has Sandra, the boss, who moves around from one department to another, evaluating the workers uh, who are working in there to see if they're you know performing well or or underperforming or something else. Now, there's a lot the the way that because I'm let's get this out there for those people who don't know. I'm friends with yeah. Vittel and I have a professional working relationship with him and I work on all of his rule books. Putting that aside, um, I know the amount of time and effort that Vittel spends into researching a game and the way that the individual departments in the game work is very thematic. Now, I don't work in a car factory myself, believe it or not, but whilst there are many thematic elements to this game, the fundamental mechanism of this game is that you are one worker and you work across all five departments. And I don't think that's how it works in a car factory, right? I don't think one person works in the research department and in the design department and in the testing department and in logistics and in administration. Yeah, but, well, I mean, you can't have like 30 workers in different departments to control, although this one no. is trying to, it's trying to foresee, I mean, I don't know, I think it's kind of based on perhaps how Japan does it perhaps over there. I think that's where the word comes from, but the, it's where uh, the word comes wrong. from. Yeah. But the word, the word Kanban, cause I've, I've looked into this. It's all about um, just in time production. So basically, if you are building a filing cabinet and that filing and you're building a hundred filing cabinets and each filing cabinet requires 50 screws, then you need 5,000 screws. Now, if you're building them on a Monday, you will order 5,000 screws to arrive on the Friday just in time production so that the screws arrive just for when you need them. And there's yeah. no excess. There's no storage. There's no warehouse. And it, it's its efficiency. Now, that's not all Kanban methodology. There is a lot of other Kanban methodology. And I know a couple of people who actually mm. work in departments that, that do that. Um, and whilst I feel that the game does represent working in a car factory thematically, apart from the one worker moving around between different departments, yeah. um, I'm not sure whether the, the Kanban methodology actually comes across. Because in the game, you have these warehouses and you order stuff in, which sits there for round after round. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a game that simulates production of cars in a car factory, and it does it quite well. Mm. Not sure whether Kanban is the right name for it, but it's quite cool. It's, it's, it's a good name, and it, it, it got me yeah. interested in it. Yeah, the whole, I mean, the car theme on this one is a pretty strong one, particularly having, like, the boss run around. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, someone had mentioned that you know oh my god all the spaces i wouldn't be too worried about that because there is a technically only i think about five spaces you actually put your worker on well five different departments with a five of different spaces departments each. Yeah. it's just the fact of how everything is interconnected like you yeah. know why you're getting the designs then you need to go get the parts then you got to go build these cars and then you got to go test them on the track mm -hmm. or do some more than others but yeah that that's where the meat and the smoke coming out of your ears you know will, will happen on this but yeah, it's only so many actual spaces to go to, so that bit's technically the easy part. <laughs> yeah. But it's definitely one there. Um, Hilmar had mentioned uh, uh, the chap who runs Midgard in Iceland. Um, yes, we did play, the first time I think I played the EV version was online with Vital. Uh, right. Because I think it might have been at your GridCon, actually. Might have been at one of your GridCon online ones. Um, oh, it probably was, yeah, virtual, yeah. Yeah, because we, we played it, and I'd only played the previous one so i had to kind yeah. of read up the rules on this and we played it and it was certainly enjoyable but we had one person who was like the dictionary definition of i don't know a, a, an amalgamation of ap min max slow not paying yeah. attention all the bad things you can think in the game are just basically conglomerated into this one chap and I'm, i was actually wondering if vital was going to blow his top <laughs> <laughs> dealing with this guy because he thought this was going to be like a free hour game as i knew it wasn't right. <laughs> so, you know apparently this person is infamous <laughs> so yes but i know exactly yeah. who you're talking about yeah yeah exactly you know it as well so yeah. yeah that made for a rather interesting first like game of it but as soon as i played it i knew <laughs> oh yeah kanban's like you know once it comes out because mechanically it's like you've given me the same thing i love about kanban except now i can actually see what's going on yeah <laughs> which is always a big thing yeah okie doke right time stamps away okay day. number nine right this one well it's <sighs> I wasn't certain which one to pick, and it's almost a crossover. I don't know whether it counts or not, um, but we just had Paul go like, um, on about Agricola, which is certainly the one. I couldn't decide whether 
to put Caverna or Fields of Arl as my one. And I don't know why all mine right. are showing us tickers. I need to check that. But, uh, you know, I... <sighs> Because when I was thinking, like, right, it's this is going to be on the list somewhere. It's going to be Caverna. And then I thought, well, hang on a minute. Fields of Isles is the one I prefer mechanically. But then which one's more thematic? And I couldn't quite tell because one's a massive sandbox. Mm -hmm. And the other one is your dwarfs farming and going on adventures now and again. So it's it it was a tough one. But like I say... And you went pick, with? Well, I'm, I'm showcasing Fields of Isles for the yes. most part. But I mean, you could... I, I think you could toss and turn between the two but i think the chat's kind of a sort of agreeing with me on fields of Arl. yeah fields this of one yeah 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 this one you know one type of euro game i do love as a sandbox game i do love mm -hmm. just being able to do what i feel like this is my problem with the Grickler. it wants you to do a piece of everything or you get penalized caverna and Arl especially are just uh what do you want to do go nuts yeah. you want to have all the sheep in the world go nuts there you are and this one has about a million different things I can do. It's like, I'll level up all my tools, build buildings, extend the dikes, go farm peak, go keep animals, go make little coats, go deliver stuff to local villages. It, it, literally everything I can think of to do with farming and trade is in this game. And the fact that I can even play it with three players now with the expansion, which then yep. thinks, oh, did you have enough to do before? No, now you get to have tea and go to <laughs> export. It's like, Jesus. <laughs> but, but I do love this. This is like, you know, I want to get the farming theme out of a game, out of all the farming ones that there are. And surprisingly, there's quite a lot of them, which is good. Yeah. I like the farming theme. Fields of Isles, my pick. And I think some of that is not only just how, like, you can do everything. I think it's also because of the tool system, which I really yeah. like. The fact that all the actions are linked to the tool that you would expect. The baker has an oven. The woodcutter has an axe. And if you make the tool better, the action is better. It really does do well on that theme even if you fits. do have to remind yourself of the rules every time you play it yeah <laughs> but ah, uh, not enough people talk about this one because they usually talk about agricola or caverna not i my mind i mean I'm... i can play agricola i'm just not the biggest fan of it and caverna is fantastic as well but i think maybe just the fact that you need an expansion to get it above two players because i to yeah. be honest yes i can play it with three players but i pretty much play it solo right yeah i mean even though agricola was on my list Mm. I will likely never, ever play Agricola again because I mm. personally believe it has been replaced by other games. And I know a lot of people criticize me and say, oh, no, Agricola is by far the best one. I, I, I would be quite happily never to, having, never to play Agricola again because we have Caverna, Feast for Odin, Fields of Arl, and I would mm. prefer to play any of those three over Agricola. So, yeah, Agricola was yeah. on my list for thematic. Whereas I possibly wouldn't have put Caverna on, but Fields of Isle would be on. Now, quick quick mm. thing. If I had a list of like five games that I should own, Fields of Isle is on there. And I do mm. not own a copy of it, and I really should. Yeah, which I'm so. sure, because there's no reason you shouldn't enjoy this one. I've played it. I've played it about four or oh, five yeah. times and love it. All so, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It goes that. Um, a lot of people do mention like the cards and the buildings, and I get, I get that the cards can sometimes work... I mean, the cards are probably the best thing in normal Agricola, and certainly some of them do have their formatic element, but it's not that the buildings are not that either. I mean, you get quite a lot of them. It's just they're all available as opposed to getting yeah. six or seven at the start and hoping that they combo well. At least here, they do. And I kind of agree with the only channel as well, actually. That's that this is It's weird. There's a ton of rules, so it's a bit of a minefield in order to actually get it learnt, but it mm -hmm. is surprisingly relaxing. I think that's just because farming in general, I feel, is quite a relaxing theme. I feel exactly the same when I'm playing Feast for Odin. It's just enjoyable to play. Mm. I don't care about the points. I just do stuff. And I just do lots and lots of random stuff. And I go here and I build a boat. And then I go raiding or I go whaling mm. or I do this. And it's just great. I just love playing it. And it's like, oh, yeah, there's a score at the end. Add them up. How well mm. did I do? Don't care. It's like, yeah. it's just enjoyable. Really yeah, I, I I put Odin below Caverna and Fields of Arbor, but it's still high up on. It's still in my top one hundred in terms of a, a game. It's it. I had to warm up to it a bit first, and I do probably right. prefer it solo than anything else. But I would certainly be shouting at anybody who dared put Feast of Odin as a thematic Euro, because as soon as you throw in patchwork, polyomino, Tetris stuff, it, it's, it's like yeah, it's, no, gone. <laughs> it's my number one Rosenberg game, Feast for Odin. And I would never say it was thematic, even though yeah. <laughs> there's a huge amount of theme in all of the individual actions. And then you get that massive 24 page appendix book that goes into historic detail about it. That's fine. Mm. But as you say, 
you're playing Tetris with pieces to cover up spaces to get bonuses. No, <laughs> that, that oh. bit's not. So even though the individual actions might be thematic and the yeah. fact that, you know, you're eating beans and you're drinking beer and things like that, overall, yeah. mechanically, I don't think it is. Yeah, I mean, so. you, you, you would not be able to convince me on that. But no. uh, all right, cool. All right, let's move on to eights. Right, number eight. Now, this is one that I don't think I would have put on my list if you locked me in a room and told me I had to come up with my own top ten. But what, are you saying that the Patreons influenced you on this? The Patreons put this on there, and enough of them put this on, put them, put it on there, and it made me think about this game again. And the more I thought about it, <laughs> the more I thought actually this does deserve to be on this list. And that's so an acronym. Is... So he's basically saying, chat, this is your fault if you've done right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I agree. I agree with it. Anachrony. Mm -hmm. Mind Clash Games, designed by David Turtsey. And as I say, when, 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 when I saw this on the list, I was like, anachrony? Is that? Surely that's just a, a sort of abstract euro with a very nice and cool setting. But nope. is it thematic? And the more <laughs> I looked into it, I'm like, actually, yeah, there's a lot of thematic rules in anachrony. Down to the very simple fact of there is this outside hostile environment. So if you want to place your workers in your own area, you can. But if you want to place them in the outside area, you have to put them into exosuits. Right. L little things like that. The city is gradually falling apart after the asteroid hits. That, that works thematically. The time travel part of the game, which I know has come in under a lot of criticism and people say, oh, it's just a loan mechanism. Yeah, well. But it's such a good bill, loan mechanism yeah so bill and ted's excellent adventure is a film which hugely inspired me and if you haven't seen it go and see it but the idea yeah. that you can go i tell you what i really need some titanium right now so i know what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna remember that in 20 years time paul right now on august the 10th 2021 needs 100 metric tons of titanium. Right, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to remember that. And then me, in 20 years' time, goes, oh, 10th of August. Right, younger Paul needs 100 tons of titanium. I'll build a time machine and I'll send them back. So me, in 2021, goes, I want some titanium. Oh, some titanium has just appeared, which is cool. I love that, right? <laughs> but the fact is, in this game, each round represents many, many years, I think. So at some point later in the game, I actually have to build that time machine and I have to actually send back the titanium. And if I don't, it causes a, it's brilliant. It's yeah. really, I mean, really good. Yeah. And I, ju I, I just love it. Well, whether you call it thematic or not, you've got to admit that a loan system in any game is boring. It's like, yeah, I take yes. out money and then I get penalized later. The idea yeah, of yeah, yeah. you basically going, I really need this right now, open like Doctor Strange portal and then suddenly yeah, it exactly. comes out. Yeah. You know, gets you your cube, another portal opens and the flash comes through. It's just like, what well, am I too soon? But it's like, <laughs> and either that, yeah, this one's definitely a thematic one. I mean, I'm surprised it needed like the extra nudge. <laughs> I'm, 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 as, as I say, it was only yeah. because it didn't come into my mind. But as soon as they started listing it and telling me why they thought it was thematic, I was like, hmm. yeah. E even, even the little things like once you've used your workers, they're exhausted and there's two ways to wake them up. You can give them nourishment hmm. and, and, they, and they wake up and everything else and they're motivated. Or you can shout at them, bash them over the head and say, get back to work, you lazy so-and-so. And their yeah. morale goes down. And it... it, it there's just lots of little things like that in there, which are great. Yeah. It's such a cool one because when I saw that first, it reminded me of a uh, a recent series Doctor Who episode. I, I forget what it was, but they, they went to a space station and in that particular future, the corporates basically had some machine that said that you could basically sleep for about 30 seconds and get all the sleep you need so that you right. could work the other 23 hours, 58 minutes of the day or something. It was a kind of like a ridiculous idea of where things might go in the future. But it's just every time yeah. I think of the sleep mechanic in this, I sort of think it's like, yeah, you've had your 30 <laughs> seconds, get up. <laughs> so that's what you need. But yeah. uh, it's a lot of them. It's It's got a lot in it, not going to lie in terms of bits. And it's not the easiest game to grok because you've got quite a fair bit going on but yeah yep. it's very rewarding when it happens yes yeah. definitely right on that one right man number eight someone's actually mentioned this in the chat already Ooh. as potentially their number one 
uh, that was coming up for not quite my number one, although I certainly do agree it is for Matic. It's the only, as far as I'm aware, the only heavy economic game I enjoy. Because uh, okay. it's not normally my theme. I don't mind no. it too much if it's light, <laughs> but a heavy one, like you, you, I mean, I will try any game once, no matter if I would expect maybe I wouldn't like it. But, you know, there's a reason I haven't seeked out things like City of the Big Shoulders and half of the 18xx stuff. But Predator Porter is the one I get behind the Ignacy Trevichek's portal version of a lot you know a large-scale economic game about the fashion industry and a lot of it will come down to the aesthetics in that you know it looks gorgeous as old get out which certainly does help I mean poor aesthetics isn't going to help with a theme for me but the only problem is the pictures I think are not going to do it justice because they'll show too much of the old version I think yeah but, the old version wasn't anywhere near as pretty as the new version Nah, but the idea with this one being that, right, okay, you've got your fashion company, you need to do well at the show, but also run a company. You get your buildings, you get your employees, your, and then you, you buy your, the different fashion items and try and make a collection for the, you know, the show that comes on, whether it's business wear, dresses, shoes, etc. But then the, when you get to the show, they, they're ranked, the things that rank and get you points are different every time, depending where you go. Like, so one place they care more about how big your collection is. Another time they they don't really care as long as the materials are best quality. And another show, the the materials could come from you know the local warehouse down the road as far as they care, as long as it looks trendy. Yeah, and a lot of that is a good sense of what consumers are a bit like with fashion. But even the actual economic side of things is still fun you know you've got to get credit from the bank in order to do your collections you can get contracts which give you a bonus but over time they get worse and then eventually go away contracts will you know eventually dissipate with whoever they are and even the employees kind of work like if you've got a mod an accountant there we go perfect example gets your money keeps you up with the upkeep but then you've got a model here which gets a token on one of your collections to say right you have to put in so many of the same color so I've got to put in four blues. I've only got three blues in this other one. The models allow you to basically treat it as a wild and say, all right, this is my blue, which makes sense because with the models, you know, you could make any, like pretty much any clothes work if you get the right model to use it. And at least that's the way I see it with fashion, but <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. But now to say it, there's very few games about the fashion industry. A lot of people would mention something like Rococo, but I didn't really get a thematic connection with that yeah. one that 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 one felt it's more specific yeah th that one felt more euro -y to me than like Definitely. say this than say this yeah. one but it just, oh, it just looks so beautiful <laughs> it's, it's just color on the board i think i played this about a fortnight ago because somebody requested that someone come to our dice cafe and teach and it's just like yep yoink <laughs> get that one out takes a while it's not a short game but i don't care we're making fashion references dishing each other's like sort of low quality or high trend or you know even pr is a thing on here it's like you could have the worst collection in the world but if you're good on social media then that's good enough right. for me it's yeah it's, it's a solid one it, you, with an economic game you've got to give me a good theme really to suck me in mm -hmm. no co i knew no co i knew this would be on your list because <laughs> I, kn I knew you were a fan of it and yeah. i also know that it is regarded as a thematic game so mm. that, that's why I knew it was on your list. I've not played the new version. I think I played mm. the old version yeah. once when it came out, but that was in where we had like, I, I didn't like the artwork, graphic design, the rule book was awful. And it was like, we really struggled with it. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm not bothered with that. Um, but as I say, I've heard from lots of other people that it's definitely thematic. Yeah, I mean, the, like the rule books, it could use a little bit of tweaking, but it's not as bad as like some people might say, well, like, as bad as maybe some of the other portal stuff that had come the out before stuff. yeah yeah there's you know there's a couple of cards that need a bit of clarification but they have released almanacs in order you know to say right here's the yeah clarification so you can play it from the rule book fine it's you know not a, not a problem in that sense but yeah it's there's a lot going on it's going to get your thinking cap on but yeah works for me <laughs> cool all right fine on that front whoa what have we got there I was tempted on kickstarter but didn't get it in the end well hopefully you'll get a chance to play it or something because i mean a I think I, yeah, I think I grabbed a Kickstarter copy because originally they were going to retheme it as a video game they were. Uh, production, yeah. and I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad they they were brave not to. Um, mm. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm not a PR marketing person, but when they said they were going to retheme it as mm. as computer games, video games, whatever, 
I think a lot of people said, oh, that, that's a shame. You should stick with the original theme. Hmm. But like you said earlier on, how many games do we have about the fashion industry? Very few. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Because you, you mentioned Rococo. And... I don't think Rococo is about the no. fashion industry. It's about building garments for French nobles. Yeah, so one. Basically, there's yeah, one so I can't one. think of. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's it's a brave decision. I mean, if anybody else could say, Jen Sainai, like, is there another fashion themes out there if anybody knows another game about the fashion industry that isn't Predator Porter, put it in the chat because i'd be interested yeah, to know let us know and i do not recommend if you're talking beginners as in new gamers no, no <laughs> this is a he it... this is a heavy euro all right yeah. <laughs> as i say a heavy economic euro that even i like so <laughs> which isn't common all righty let's get the sevens right so this this is quite funny now because my number seven is a heavy Euro economic game. And when you said, when you were about to start your number eight, that you were going to do a heavy economic Euro, I was like, yeah, it's not going to be this one. No. Because I know you have thoughts about this game. So if you can turn your microphone off for a minute. <laughs> I try to, is, have I played this one? I'm pretty sure you've played it. And I'm pretty sure I've seen you involved in many a Facebook discussion about this game and your dislike of it. There's only one I can think of, and like dislike, I suppose dislike, yeah, but it's not hatred. <laughs> so, Brass. Yeah, I I, either Brass Lancashire brass, or Brass Birmingham for Martin Wallace. And I, ha I had this on the list, both knowing the <laughs> that you're going to argue with me that this game is not thematic. But it... let, let me tell you, the action selection mechanism of playing cards is not thematic whatsoever, right? I am not saying that this game is the most thematic game ever. In this game, you have a hand of cards and those cards either depict locations or they depict types of buildings. And you play two cards in a round and you do the actions based on the cards. Now, that is not thematic. That is, a, that is purely a mechanism. Mm. However, everything else in the game is representative of what was happening in England at the time. And there's so many rules in there that a lot of people, and I think you might be one of them, Luca, that have said, why are the rules for iron and coal different? because it's confusing. There's a totally different mechanism for how coal gets moved around the board and how coal is imported for iron. And when you actually read about how iron and coal were distributed across the country at that time, that's why the mechanisms are in there. So the whole way that you are building the canals, the way that iron and coal moves around the board, the way that things have to come from the nearest area all of the way that it works is thematic and it's mm. all of the things were ground in a thematic reason and explanation and what martin did is he basically took how it was and turned that into a game that represented both thematically and mechanically what was actually happening at the time and yeah. of course brass is played in two halves once you've played the first half when your deck runs out that is the canal period over and then the trains came along and the trains basically replaced the canals. And that's exactly what happens in the game. And suddenly the canals aren't used anymore. The trains are used and, it, and everything slightly changes. So, mm. yeah, the more I thought about this game and the first time I played Brass, I, I was in the same boat as everybody else. I was like, why have you got different rules for the black cubes and the orange cubes? This is confusing. Why don't you just have the same one? Until I actually went and started reading a bit about it. And I read about historically how iron and coal were moved around, how they were imported differently, where they were imported to and, and everything like that. And suddenly, having read about how it actually was, I went, that's exactly why these mechanisms are like that. Um, and then the next time I played it, I, I didn't suddenly feel immersed in the theme of the game. I was mm. still playing the same game. But I actually had an appreciation for why those mechanisms are the way that they are. Yeah, I mean, with this one, I actually am not going to disagree too much on the theme brand. I'm not going to call it like overly thematic, mm -hmm. but I do agree that some of that transport system and how some of the industries work in that actually does make sense. It is based on the history of how that works. So yeah. I actually don't mind it being on a thematic list. My, I mean, I'm, it's not quite as bad as hated. It's more, it, it started off as <laughs> it was hatred when I played the original version on an app. 
That was hatred. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's awful. Um, yeah. That was, that was god awful. But then when this one came out, I thought, right, I'm going to give this one a proper chance because it looks so gorgeous. I want to get it. Oh, I mean, it's let's amazing, face it. isn't it? Yeah. You know, I, I want this artist to do other things. You're going to turn yeah. up like the most boring theme ever. I mean, we're not like caring whether the theme's boring or not on this list, you know, but it's, you know, as, as long as it's thematic. But you want to take an economic game and make it look interesting. It's like, this is how you do it. This artwork yeah. is so sublime. I would have this on my wall. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I've kind of cooled off a bit now, now, and now I kind of dislike it more. But that's more mechanical than anything else. Uh, I mean, pick Lancashire or Birmingham. To me, they're exactly the same. One's got beer and the other one doesn't. I know that will cause a lot of people to mm -hmm. heads to explode. <laughs> but I always like that. But the and certainly the chat is kind of uh, half and half. You know, people can't believe I rate it a four. But <laughs> more than anything else. But there's a, there's a fair share of brass lovers and haters there. Mm -hmm. With that. The transport system, I don't mind. The card play does irk me a bit. I like having a hand of cards, but I find that my actions are kind of a bit too dictated by that hand of cards. You know, right. if I, I really need to go to, you know, X location, otherwise my mate is going to stitch me up royally. I don't have the card, can't do much about it. That happens more often than I would like. Don't forget the... you can play cards as if they were anything, but then you're foregoing an action. Yeah, which is quite which, bad when yeah. you've got a, not many actions in the game, like period. Yeah. But uh, the, I think the other thing was like, I think just when it comes to punishing games, if it's punishing in the sense that I don't feel I had much control over it, like I say, the card play doesn't help with that. It's like, it irks me a bit. And if you do get punished early on in this game, I don't know how you can possibly recover. You need to at least have got a ground somewhere, whether it's you're dominating a particular industry or you've got mm -hmm. a few locations on the map. But if something goes wrong early, I've never seen anybody suddenly pull it back and suddenly come up with something because, well, everybody else is rich getting richer, whereas you're still struggling in there. But I mean, I'm, I'm fine with it being on a thematic list. Mm -hmm. I've got no problem with that. Some people in the chat kind of are a bit ho-hum on it. Like some say the card play sort of destroys the theme and that, and I agree, the card play doesn't make sense, but everything else you said makes sense. So yeah. it's, it's it's on there. You, you can kind of argue it both ways, but honestly, I'd say it's one of the more thematic economic games out there. Cool. Oh, God. Right. Ugh, the old, You're uh, number seven. Uh, uh, the old version. <laughs> oh, yeah, the old version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the old version was just bad. Yeah. Okay, day. so my seven, have we got a crossover? Oh, look, brass. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> that would shock everybody. I'd break the internet. It would shock it. everybody. It's like, where's Luke gone? He's been right. replaced by a robot. Yeah. Now, this is the one where I think I'm going to have to try and defend myself here because I think it's thematic, even though it's not. this is less about the mechanics at all. It's more okay. about what the theme of the game is, what you're doing, and how... I mean, some of the rules actually do work from a thematic sense, but your your basic mechanic is just, oh, it's worker placement and I collect cards. Okay. Why is that thematic in the sense? I'm trying to guess the game. Artipia. No, I've not played many games from them. Fair enough. Or oh, Stronghold, if you like it, Nat. It's called The Pursuit of Happiness. Oh, this, right. This one, oh, that ticker is getting annoying. There we go. Yeah, the Pursuit of Happiness is one I may have to defend slightly, but I do absolutely adore, again, this kind of sandboxy Euro game. And granted, it's not necessarily the main mechanism of it, because the main mechanism is I go, I put my hourglass worker on a space and collect a type of card. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're collecting projects that you're doing in your life or whether you're doing, you're getting the green cards, which are items, yellow is a job, uh, pink is a date. Or a relationship you know and you're just sort of leveling up like a black cube on each card to say oh well i've got you know how big's my shoe collection is it like half a shoe is it 10 shoes or is it an entire wardrobe you know and and you're leveling up the projects to say right i'm learning martial arts i've started off learning how to kick now i can throw people over my shoulder now i'm a black belt now i'm a martial arts master you know it's 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 those sort of levels but you are telling the story of your life because i describe it as the game of life the euro game yeah. Yeah. That whole thing of I'm going to tell my life how I see fit. You know, so I, I'm a nerd kid. Right. What do I fancy Grammy items? Well, well, they would clearly have like a a, a a Warhammer collection. Right. There's the card I'm going to buy first. I'm going to date somebody. There's like the quintessential stereotypical like nerd girl from all the rom coms you see. It's like, right. That's me, girlfriend. Go with it. And you inject a bit of the theme yourself. But everything kind of makes sense because you've also got a stress marker that sort of hinders you. You're playing until you basically stress yourself out and die in old age, 
because that what would happen but you know when you get the job you need the resources to keep the job going every time every mm-hmm. upkeep round it pays you money though so you can go buy the items if you lose your job like you haven't got the resources it stresses you out and you know that would naturally happen you've got your hourglasses are your workers but when you get a job and when you get a partner you lose some of those each round because they have an upkeep of actual time yep, because time. yeah go <laughs> go figure and you know you get a partner if you're just dating them it's like easy you're in a relationship it sucks up a little bit of time but you get some like resources it's, it's basically creativity and like it's intelligence and stuff like that it's like personality stuff yeah but then when you have a family you start getting points because it's long-term happiness but then a lot of your time is sucked up because you got to deal with the kids mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and you can just create these wonderful thematic stories particularly with the expansions that allow you to do things for the community like babysitting and walk the dog or go on expeditions or you can even now plan ahead for cards so you can take a card put it on a dream board and it will get more points will progress over time the longer you leave it because you're desiring to go visit Venice at some point in the future. Right. But if you don't fulfill that dream, you lose points because you didn't fulfill your best dream. It's just mm-hmm. a lot of stuff. And I've just created stupid stories here where I've gone like, all right, I'm going to try and date two people at once. But the rules in the game actually specifically stress you out like crazy if you try that, <laughs> you know, but I thought I'd try it for a laugh. And yeah, it didn't end well. But then a little mini expansion lets you have kids as well, like actual physical kids cards right. in there. So I decided to try and do a Tom Vassal and see how many kids I could have. <laughs> I bottled by the time I got to five. Right, <laughs> so okay. I was trying to get to seven. I think that's how many he's got. But so as soon as I got to five, it's like I can't physically keep up with this upkeep and stress. Yeah. I've got, you know, I don't want to like, I can't ditch them. So I gotta keep it going. And I say a lot of it is down to just the stories you can tell. I mean, that board games that tell stories thing that Ignacy puts forward, I think that's got to be a good representation of feeling in a sense. Yeah, Yeah. who's telling the story? I mean, I hate to use brass as an example, but like I say, who's telling the story of how I built up my train with a ton of coal on it? It's nobody. So I've not played this game. I figured that, yeah. I do know about it. And you've described it perfectly well. And if I had played it, it would very likely be on my list. I do have an interesting story to tell you about this. Okay. Two years before this game came out, between two and three years before this game came out, I was working on a game myself. Yeah. Okay. I'd sat down and had discussions about this game idea that I had with such people like Vlari Javatel, for example. There are people who were around me in that period of time where I was telling them about this game that I was designing. The I, Nobody's ever done a game like this before, but the idea of this game is it would tell the story of your life. Every round would be 10 years. And the unique thing about this game is that at the end of the game, every player would die. And that the player who won had the most happiness points. You see where I'm going with this? <laughs> yeah, the exact I designed this game, right? And then... After this game came out, I met up with one of the designers at Essen, uh, David, because David used to have a YouTube channel uh, and he'd done a review of Alchemists from CGE, which I'd seen. So I was Mm. sat there and I was chatting with him. We'd never met before and we chatted and everything else. And I told him about this game and he was like, no way. And I'm like, yes way. And I've got got witnesses as well. So yeah, so I, I was working on a game which thematically is exactly the same as this. <laughs> um, and it was just, yeah, it's just really, really weird. Of course, I then didn't do anything with it um, because then this game came out and it's just, mm. yeah, maybe Vladimir and David know each other. I don't know. No, I have to say, yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I'm almost thinking I should have put this higher on the list or something, but I just thought I, I was expecting more people to come at me for the card system in it, but nobody seems to be going on about that. Nope. So maybe I should have put this one higher, but I don't know. I, it's a sandbox Euro. I played the game of life as a kid and still enjoyed it for its nostalgia sake. So the Euro version of it where sort of Essen and just thought, right, okay, so I get to basically do what I like in my life. And I tried to create myself in the game so it's like right. all right what's my child trait nerd all right there's a good start all right grab yep. a miniature collection oh board game collections here all right perfect you know no relationship i skipped that bit you know job you know, so we're there and just yeah. tried to sort of mimic exactly what it was and i think i got it pretty close right i won the game even though i'm not sure i would have nice tried to create that life normally <laughs> but but say so i had no reason to move that but now it's 
Ah, love it a bit. Right, okie doke. So Maybe we, don't. we need to get a move on. Yeah, six. Right, number six. No surprise that there is more than one Vital Lacerda game on my list. In fact, a few people, when they were giving me suggestions of a thematic Euro game, they just said all Lacerda games. They didn't actually list a specific one. They just said they're all thematic. And it's like, well, you know, thank you very much for that. But I, I need specific ones. Um, and even people who like all of Vittel's games will have different opinions on which ones are the most thematic. So anyway, number six on my list. So personally, I feel this is more thematic than Kanban. And so this one is one I can think of. This is Lisboa. Oh, that was not the one I was expecting. All right, carry <laughs> on with that. Okay. Now, again, Vittel is Portuguese. Vittel lives in Lisbon. Vittel knows about the history of Lisbon. I had no, I, I don't know anything about history. My entire knowledge of history and geography is from board games. And I knew nothing about what happened in Lisbon in 1755. Now I do. And this is another game that if you don't know the history and you don't read the bits of theme that are dotted through the rule book, you might just think it is a completely abstract game where you are putting pieces on board, removing cubes of different colors, going somewhere to do something, right? Hmm. It's, it's not just that, because Vittel knows all about the history of this time, and once you start reading about the history of this time, the game comes to life. You are, you, everything you do in the game is what was done at the time. The rebuilding of the city after the three disasters, the earthquake, um, the fires and the flooding, and everything else, the fact that you're removing the rubble cubes and you're actually using that rubble to rebuild the city, which is exactly what was done. Um, the way that the streets are done, that was a decree from the whoever it was, the king at the time. He basically said, right, I want that street to all be shoe shops. I want that street to all be cake shops, you know, jewelers or goldsmiths or whatever. So that's that's all done. The way that the public buildings work, they're all historically accurate buildings. And the way that the nobles work, again, if you look at it from a purely mechanical aspect, you can say, hmm. well, I, I, I just visit that person and that person will want either this resource or that resource and that person will allow me to do this action. But it's all historically accurate. It's all connected and it's all tied in um, with, with everything that's going on. Then if we look to the other definition of theme, when I play Lisboa, I actually feel like I am rebuilding the city of Lisboa after a disaster, not just moving cubes around on a board. It, mm -hmm. You are rebuilding things, you are recreating it, and you are slowly clearing the city. So, yeah, I, I think that's quite a thematic game for me. The first part I agree with in the sense that, yeah, it definitely has that historical thing that these things happened although it made my first game a little bit tricky because i felt like i felt like i had to learn a history lesson before i actually got around <laughs> to learning the mechanics it's like okay i i get that this is the history but history is one of my least favorite subjects and mm -hmm. it's only not my strong suit so it's like can i get into how on earth i'm supposed to manipulate or see what's going on on the board because i do like how it looks but blimey everything blends together with that and yes. i know that's authentic to what's in it's, lisbon yeah. i get it but and it looks pretty but man it's like bit of a graphic design sort of like trying to a lot of the space is kind of blur when it comes yes. to blue for me but i do i mean it's on my shelf i still love it it's probably it's time with vinyos at the moment it's like oh is it my third or fourth favorite lacerdo was like because i love this card play mechanic yeah yeah the, the, the bit with the grid actually don't you know I, I like it but i don't go mad for it it's this card play thing because i love multi-use cards yeah so you know here's the card do i play it underneath or do i put it up there and it's like oh that is so much fun to do and there's just a lot of cool things with it i'm not so sure about that second part though because i get that the idea is that you are supposed to rebuild the city after it's done but i don't find myself thinking that that's what i'm doing when i'm shifting right. cubes around on this because i mean is that how the streets in lisbon are where they're sort of in these like row, convenient yep. rows and columns um, yeah perhaps and I, I i actually went to lisbon uh two years ago now yeah, right. just over two years ago now. <clears throat> and uh, I, I went there because there's a convention that, that, that it takes place in Portugal each year, and I was invited to it. And I thought, well, I tell you what, I want to go for a couple of days in Lisbon, not only because I haven't been there before, but I specifically wanted to go because of the game. And I went yeah. to the center of the city, and I walked up and down those streets, and I went to all of the places in the game that, that, that is pictured, 
and it was weird. And yeah, that that's how the streets are. And now, of course, okay. things have changed. You've now got a McDonald's on the, the Goldsmith Street, but you know, <laughs> it's it, it, it's there and it and yeah. it is there. And it was it was quite surreal walking into the center of Lisbon and looking around and going, This looks familiar. Right. I've never been there and I haven't looked at photos of it. But it all looked familiar, and that was just mm. because of uh, you know, Ian's artwork and graphic design on the game. Mm that kind of jumped out and it was like, oh yeah, I sort of feel like I've been here before, but I haven't actually been here before. Yeah, I've not been to Lisbon myself. And, and um, Funny you mentioned a con actually, because I literally looked at the description and it's Lyricon. Lyricon. It? It's about yeah. an hour and a bit north of mm. Lisbon. But we, we flew into Lisbon um, and then drove from there. I wonder if that will, wonder if that will come back again or something, because I'll give an excuse to visit Portugal. It, it will. Uh, but, it will, mm. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I sort of get it. I, I know it's very historically sound in the sense mm -hmm. that everything in the game has a historical reason why it's there. I think it's kind of like, as I don't know if Leslie's talking about this one or a different game from the chat, but it's, I think like, I'm playing it, I'm enjoying the mechanics. I think just when I'm pushing those cubes around on that grid, it's like it's not jumping out at me. Although some of that could understandably be because I've not been to Lisbon and seen it up close. I mean, you've you, just you explained don't... what the streets look at and it's like, yeah. okay, that makes a bit more sense than I thought it did. You don't need to, but if you look at the, the treasury, the way that the treasury moves up and down, yeah, where the treasury is, is a modifier to the cost of, like, influencing the nobles, I think. Now, the first time I played it, and when I was working on, you know, the video and the rules and everything else, it was like, okay, so the cost to go and see Matey Boy there is, like, four coins, but if the treasury is at a minus one, then it only cost me three coins. Fine. Yeah. But then when you actually look into what that represents and then you think, ah, right, the treasury is doing OK. So the nobles are actually they're They're not worrying about that, which means they're yeah. a bit more laid back and they're easy. Whereas if the treasury marker is on the plus two, they're all fretting. They haven't got any time because they're all worried about the city treasury. So if you try and go and see them and say, uh, excuse me, can I borrow some sugar? Hmm. They're like, oh, get away. We're too busy. And. You know, as soon as you explain that, and then you speak to Vittel about it, and you say, is that what you had in mind? And it's, it's like, of course that's what I had in mind. <laughs> yeah. That's where the mechanism came from. Yeah. It wasn't that's... just a, a mechanism that was thrown in. It was like, well, that's how it was. Yeah. Therefore, I'm going to put that into this game, and I'm mm. going to do it this way. Yeah, the theme's definitely there. It's, it's it's like I said before. It's like when you learn it, you feel like you have to take a history lesson first, and it's like yeah. once you've had that history lesson, it jumps out a bit more. But if you sort of went into this just literally trying to learn the rules, and believe me, Paul said he's done a video. You're gonna need to watch it to yeah. learn this game yeah. because it's a smorgasbord of rules, especially yeah. when you get that menu, which is the scariest menu I've ever seen, full of stuff yeah. on it. It's like yikes. here's your player aid with a summary. It's it, but it's an eight page booklet. Yeah, yeah. yeah good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, it it was a mammoth the first time i did not get taught it well i'm so glad i bought yeah. it myself and tried to fit you know what let's just watch a video and self-teach it okay yeah, that's, that's pretty so that I, I everybody else was thinking of gallerist and that was the one i thought it was going to be because that's the one i might have given the edge to yeah but, but we'll see oh, oh god has he got three lacerders on this list that could work <laughs> you're number six We'll see. Yeah, my number six as we get back. Right. Um, I'm not going to talk too much on this, mainly because, as I say, the stream is getting on and we did partially agree that if we crossed over, we wouldn't rabbit on too much about the pick. But yeah, people called it earlier. In fact, I've got to mark this as a tally chart. This is technically the first official Our crossover. Our first crossover. Yep, yeah, because Arl is technically not the same as a Grigler. But Kanban, yeah. I mean, right. it, it was going to be on mine. I love it. It's, you know, already love cars are fun in general so it's already got the fun theme but it's not even just the whole idea of here's the blueprints get the stuff and build up cars it's sandra that really sells yeah. it it's like everybody's had that boss that you can't stand <laughs> who's had a bad day and is just wanting to like find any excuse to do you in or so you're like you know, you know what i'm you know life sucks for me so i'm gonna make your day hell yeah and you, you know you're caring more about dodging her than you are doing your actual job of building the cars it's like i, I remember doing a um, I copied, well, not copied, I, I was doing the, the top 10 annoying characters or something similar to what Dice Tower did a while back, which was like a hilarious list. And Sandra was on there because you, right. um, you, you have to play the game on meme mode, really, but that still makes her one of the most annoying characters to wander mm -hmm. around. Because it's like, I want to go there because the spot's very, oh, Sandra's going to come by in a minute. She's going to come by. Like, if yeah. you don't have two design, if you don't have three designs on your board, who's been a naughty yeah. boy? Exactly. I'll tell you what, I, I'm, I'm glad this is on your list hmm? because 
there was one really thematic part about the game that I forgot to mention earlier on. And I, and I was thinking, yeah. 10 minutes after we've spoken about it, can I just interrupt and say, oh, by the way, Kanban, but now you've mentioned it, the way that the meetings work is genius. Yeah. So in each meeting, there are four performance goals. And in turn order, a player chooses which performance goal they want to speak about and they get the maximum number of points. So, for example, we go into the meeting. Luke is ahead of me in turn order. He says, "Look, Sandra, look, look at, look at me. I, I, I've got, I've got three navigation parts in my, in my cupboard." And you yeah. go, "Oh, well done, Luke. Here, have a bunch of points." <laughs> and then I come along and go, "Um, Sandra, I, I've got some <laughs> navigation parts in my warehouse as well." And he was like, "Yes, Paul, but Luke's already said that." And basically, thematically, it just. <laughs> It's brilliant. Now, yeah, in the game, it's very simple. You have a times three, a times two, and a times one. Luke went first and mm. he goes on the times three. I went second and go on a time two. But thematically, you yeah. can just imagine you sat at the back <laughs> of the boardroom meeting going, um, yeah. I, I've got some as well. Uh, and he's going, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Whenever I play it with mates, we are doing, I'm doing that reference because I always get suckered into the theme and sort of ham it up a bit. And I'm always yeah. doing that thing of like, oh, I've done this one. And then my mate follows me on as I've seen it. It's like, yeah. it's like it, a it, copycat. It, it, I mean, how many games, <laughs> how, how many games have meetings in boardrooms as part of the game? I don't, mm. I don't know any. And how many of them are done in such a, they're actually fun. A, a thematic yeah. way that's actually <laughs> a lot of fun to actually play that part out. So yeah, I'm glad Crazy. it's on your list. Love it. People called it and it's like, yeah, it had to be. It's it's yeah. it's I think it's now overtaken Galarus. Galarus was my favourite Lacerda whilst I had to put up with the stronghold graphic design issue and that, but I think once E V came out, it's like with yeah. the solo mode as well, it's like, yeah, as much as I love Galarus, Kanban had to just about eclipse it now. Yeah. So one yeah, crossover so far, and we are halfway through our lists. Yep, that's half of your guess, and uh, <laughs> I only guessed three, so we'll see. All right, uh, five. Right. Number five is a game which, when I first made my list before asking for help, it was definitely on there. And a number of other people suggested it as well. And I'm not quite sure. All of the other ones on this list, I've been able to justify why I think thematically it's on there, either by talking about yeah. the feel of the game or mechanically and how the mechanisms relate to how it would be. This one is higher on my list than everything else that I've listed so far, but I don't know uh, why? <laughs> if I can explain. It's Spirit Island. Okay. And Spirit Island for me, and if we talk about we, we've talked about games like Kanban, which is about working in a car factory, and it's yeah. because that's how a car factory would work. Well, Spirit Island is fictional, so I, I don't know what it would be like if there were actual spirits living on an island that, you know, rise up against the colonists trying to invade them. I, you know, but everything about this game when you play it feels like it is spirits who have awakened, who are growing in power when these you know the colonials have come over and are trying to build cities and take over the land and it's just i, I mean i love the game it's one of my favorite cooperative games of all time i i, I just love it hmm. this also started a very very big debate which turned into a massive argument on <laughs> forums about because i called euro? spirit island a euro hmm. um <laughs> And it, it, it is a hybrid, but I personally believe it is more to the Euro end. But people were saying it has miniatures and therefore it can't be a Euro because it has miniatures, which is nonsense. Yeah, that makes no sense. <laughs> it's absolute nonsense. But uh, yes. All right, all right. Uh, the, to that person, I'm going to give them a copy of Council of Four. The, it wasn't the, the just cool, one person. The cool mini, the cool <laughs> mini, all right, well, I'm going to give them all a copy of Council of Four by Cool Mini or Not. I was saying, you yeah. tell me that miniatures can't be in a Euro game. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now... The card play in Spirit Island, and I'm going to mention this in some other games that I've got coming up on my list. You could just look at the card and ignore the name and ignore the artwork and read the effect of the card. And it says, move three things to an adjacent space and then do this. Yeah. And you could, you could, if you wanted to, see it from a purely abstract point of view of moving counters that are on the around the board. If you do that, you're missing out on, on a trick because when that card is called Tsunami, mm. 
and then you read exactly what the effect of the card does and you go yep that's exactly what the effect L like we mentioned with agricola earlier on you've you've played a wheelbarrow what does the wheelbarrow do it allows you to carry three clay whatever you know it does what yeah. a wheelbarrow would do every card in spirit island the effect on it yeah you can imagine it happening when when you're you're doing the thing um and and the theme of spirit island as well I, I mean, I just like the theme of Spirit Island. I like the fact that we've got a game where instead of colonizing an island, you're actually defending the island mm. from the people who are trying to colonize it. Yeah, and you're still trying to protect the natives. It's it's a good switch um, and, and it works really well. So, yeah, I personally think Spirit Island is a thematic game. It's certainly thematic. I was umming and ahhing about the Euro side of it. It's sort of like you could argue it one way or the other. But, uh, I mean, theme-wise, it definitely does fit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Mainly because of the like, spirits themselves and that. But, yeah, the, the cards do. Some of them you're not necessarily seeing alone. But, yeah, I mean, there's, like, Cast into the Briny Deep and a few of those other ones, which, like, you know, take off entire sections of the island or something. It's like there's got to be theme for, for that. Yeah. Even And, like I say, miniatures... What kind of argument is that? That makes no sense to yeah, me. <laughs> so. <laughs> they could just be counters, but they're, they're better as miniatures. I mean, the reason why I'm saying it's more on the on the Euro end of the spectrum is mm. it's all <laughs> it's all choices, it's all decisions mm. that you have to make. At the start of your turn, you have to decide which of the three things you want to do. Then you've got to decide where to put your tokens. Then you've got to decide which cards you want to take. Then you've got to decide which cards mm. to play. It's all resources, it's all moving things around. Yeah. The only actual randomness is, I think, the the Explorer deck when you don't know where they're going to com be coming in from. But yeah. you can sort of mitigate that because you know mm. what cards are in the deck. So if you're still in stage one and the Mountains card has come out, you know the Mountains card isn't going to come yeah. out, things like that. Um, and you've got to react. You've got to adapt to whatever they're doing. Um yeah, because yeah, some people, because yeah. some people don't like the event deck, but I still, I love having the event deck because it's like if you play it without it, then it is apart from the invader deck, it is very like, like lack lack of luck. You know, there is nothing. Yeah. you you can predict almost everything. It's kind of like I don't want to predict almost everything. I want occasionally something to happen the curveball. that could I yeah the curveball that says oh you get this really cool effect that happens, but then you also get the curveball effect that everything just got worse. Yeah, you know, it, it just makes things for a bit more of an interesting game. Yeah. Okay, but no, nah, fair enough. All right, my number four. Not played this one number in a five. while. Oh, sorry, number five. five. Ah. Oh, god. Yeah. Good point. All right. Spoilers this are. this one has been put in the chat, and this is one that I mentioned earlier, where I thought like, okay, there's this one mechanic in it which technically does not make sense mm -hmm. <laughs> when you were talking about the theme itself. But again, we're going back to the like that second thing of do I feel like I'm doing what it is? And of course, I do feel like I'm running a vineyard in viticulture. You know, planting the vines, growing them, getting the grapes, turning it into wine, fulfilling the orders. But you know, buying like windmills and little cellars and stuff like that. It, I mean, I want to drink wine while I'm playing this game. It, it just feels like such a nice. It was almost, I'd say, relaxing in a sense. There's tension for spaces, yeah, but I feel quite relaxed with a glass of wine, playing viticulture. Although, as much as I say I love the game, you gotta throw Tusky in it. Um, Tusky. Yes. If you don't get yeah. Tuscany for Viticulture, you are playing pretty much unplayable. half a game. Yeah. I wouldn't say unplayable, but it's like, yeah, it's well, half a game. Unplayable for me. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't play without Tuscany. Yes, I admit. Yeah. You, know, you, need, you don't need everything in it, but you need that board. That board says it all where you've got four seasons that oh. have lots of different actions. You've got the different cards, and I love the structures as well. I mean, there's all sorts about that board that's really good, but it's like compared to the original board, there's kind of like no contest. But yes, I get that grapes do not age in years. All right. I get yeah. that that is the thing. That's the one disconnect. But, yeah. and, you know, as so I says, it's like, yes, you can win without producing wine because mm -hmm. I have done that with the right structure cards. I got a cafe and a restaurant and I spent the entire time basically churning grapes into the cheapest wine that I could shove in, you know, what, not into actual wine, but just chucking them into the cafe and restaurant. And I did win. But like I say, I was... It, it fit with the structures I got and it just yeah. added a nice little thematic twist in a sense. Yes, granted, I wasn't necessarily doing the exact full on vine ordering stuff, but I still had to get grapes and basically have a farm in a sense. I just wasn't necessarily doing the bottling part of it. <laughs> but uh, I do love it. One of 
I don't know. I fell in love with it when it first started, and I played it before Tuscany. I did like it beforehand, yeah. but it was kind of like, oh, it lingers halfway in the top 100. And then I got Tuscany. Obviously, not every module in it was useful. It's like, I don't care if I'm making cheese or making olive oil or whatever those extra boards did. But, you know, give me the cards, give me the board, give me these structures. I do love them. It, it's like saying one of the most relaxing worker placements. Mm. So you said that there were parts of it that you don't think are thematic. Is that, is that the grapes bit? Yeah. I mean, wine ages over years and that, yeah. you know, you can keep it years. That's fine. It's just the idea that when your wine ages, so does the grape. It's like, yeah, no, your grape would have been moldy by that point. It's like yeah. it would have gone rancid and disintegrated. So there is that slight bit that's abstracted. And I know if I say, oh, viticulture is thematic, people will hinge on that one point. But it's like, yeah, yeah but it doesn't stop you feeling like you're producing wine. Mm. Um, and as I Philip mentions viticulture or vinyos. Yeah, viticulture, hands down. I've got vinyos. I like it. But yeah, it would be no contest as to which one I prefer. I don't know about Paul, though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I much prefer I much prefer Vinyos um, I thought, Mike. as a game, but I v Vinyos is a Lacerda game. It's a heavy game. It's about the production of wine, and it is more realistic, thematic to me than Viticulture. Mm. Viticulture is a light to medium game where the setting is wine or production, medium. but <laughs> I'm. Viticulture has a couple of bits in it that feel a bit thematic, but overall, I wouldn't have put Viticulture mm. in my list of thematic games. Right. Um, but I knew it would be in yours. That's another one which I knew it mm. would be in your list. Um, and I can see that there's a bit of theme in there for some bits. Um, and as you say, the buildings do what that building you think would do. Um, yeah. It, so. It's a... Like the nature of it, because uh, Vinyos is more about running the wine business rather than actually yeah. producing the wine. Because, I mean, when you want to produce wine, you literally just put a token on the track and let it mature a bit, which is like, OK, I got to think hard that that's wine because it is basically a square chit in front of me. But yeah. you are getting it from the different regions. They each have different qualities. That makes sense. And yeah. with Vinyos, it's not so much about having the vineyards in front of me. That's like I say, I enjoy the game in general, but it's not that bit I like the most. It's the fair. It's yeah. a bit like Preda Porter with the show. It's like you're gearing yeah. up for that fair and then you're trying it's to do it. It's all about the wine tasting at the fair. Mm, and Yeah. That's where like the strong theme in Vigno sort of pops out. Yeah. <laughs> Everything to do with that because it all makes sense. Yeah. But fair enough. That's to say, not, you know, but it's kind of like, huh, maybe this is maybe this is uh, my brass in a sense. Like, it's like we kind of uh, kind of see why it's on the list, but maybe don't go that like, it's the massive thematic. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, right. Fours. I'm going to get into a lot of trouble for this one. <laughs> From me or the chat? <laughs> Probably everybody. But I don't care. Because as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, this is a Euro game. Most oh, so it's not even the theme. Oh, God, we're okay. going to this one now. It, yeah, well, th this is the thing. I'm going to come into a lot of criticism for, first of all, classing this as a Euro game. And second of all, classing it as thematic. Mage Knight. Oh, get over it. No. <laughs> now, bear with me a minute. Get him. <laughs> Mage Knight is more Euro than the other end of the scale. Yes. There are dozens of mechanisms in there, and most of them are Euro mechanisms. Okay? There is no output randomness. The card draw is about the only random bit, but you are in control of so many things, you are making so many decisions, and you are planning things out. Now... Let's talk about thematic connection. A lot of people criticize this game for having a million rules with a million exceptions. Every single one <laughs> is thematic and can be explained thematically. The number of movement points that it costs to move through a forest at nighttime is more than the cost to move through a forest at daytime. That's thematic. Trust me, I run around forests <laughs> both in the day and at night just to see what it was. The rules about... <laughs> The rules about units inside uh, enemies inside fortification inside fortresses. If you have a token in a castle or whatever it's called, I can't remember, a keep. That's it. If you have a token inside a keep, it's face down. But if you go next to the castle during the daytime, you reveal the token. 
But if you go next to the castle in the night time, you do not reveal the token. Now, to a lot of people, that is a fiddly exceptional rule that they have to remember. For me, that just makes absolute complete sense because if it's daytime, they're all awake, they're all up. So if you go nearby, you look and you can see them. Whereas at night time, they're not all up, they're actually all asleep. So if you go next to the next to the keep at night time, you can't see them. Every rule in the game, for me, makes thematic sense. And we haven't, I haven't mentioned the cards yet. All of the cards, all of the effects of all of the cards does exactly what it says. So although Mage Knight is set in a completely fantasy world and fictional and everything else, every ability on every monster, every card that you play, all of the little rules that are in there are like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I can see that thematically. When you try to burn down a monastery, you fight a monster, but you can't bring your units with you. It's because your units refuse to join you in the sacrilegious effort of burning down a monastery. You know, and, and what, 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 as I say, what a lot of people view as, oh my God, this game's got loads of exceptions and things I have to remember, they all, they all work thematically for me. So yeah, there you go. That's it. Have I, have I been disconnected yet? I think I've been disconnected. No. <laughs> no, you're you're there. I mean, I had to try and find a half decent picture for Jill. Was that because it seemed that like everything was all about cards? There you go. But There's I mean, a picture. I actually don't disagree that it's a euro because right. it feels like the opposite end of the spectrum for what I want in an adventure game. <laughs> it's like, yes. okay, this is gonna be a euro one. I just yeah. cannot stand it mechanically. I mean, I I do not get the strong theme out of this one. I mean, it's okay to. I mean, a card. You know, if the card's called Heal, Heal Two. Okay, yeah, it's not difficult to mess that up. Yeah. But I, I just remember uh, the first time I like tried to play it. Once I was able to finally get over the rules, because <laughs> there is a million rules in here. But I, I find myself wandering around the map with the sort of City of King style like terrain that sort of just comes and goes whenever it feels like. <laughs> like here, just like this is like just random wood there and a hex as part of that. But I don't know. I remember going to a village, doing a little bit of trading then wandering around trying to find out where I was meant to go, found a cave, there was a dragon in it, it killed me, it's like, okay, that seemed a bit harsh at level one, but fine, you know, it's there. Eventually found a castle, couldn't get in it, it was literally like Monty Python with the French. It's like, <laughs> like okay, like, is there anyone else here I can talk to? What am I supposed to do here? Is that, ah, this game rubs me the wrong way, like, so, so, so you, you had a bad. You had a bad teacher, whoever taught you the game? No, that was solo. Um, <laughs> oh right okay you, you can't find dragons in monster dens um and well, the keep... I it was something say, if I, yeah <laughs> in fact that's my picture that that one there huh? goldix just go back that's For mine him. i think that's my picture oh maybe it it's is. not because it's on a clear base no it is, is uploaded it? by paul grogan <laughs> wow, that's your picture that's 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 years old that picture yeah well spotted <laughs> so yeah i mean <clears throat> mage knight does have that effect on some people um, and what I will say to you is if you went to that keep at night and you decided to attack that keep at night without knowing what was inside, then you're in trouble. But part of the game of Mage Knight <laughs> is you, you, don't, you don't do that yeah. unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> uh, you, look at, you, you look at the keep, you look, you look at what's inside and you work out because the, because the combat is deterministic, you can actually work out whether you are able to defeat that enemy or not before you just jump into it. So... The fact that you got into a battle which then killed you and you felt, well, this game's rubbish, what he's, do he's doing. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't work out like that. You do have a lot more control over what you do. But so, anyway. So what, as I say, there's a, a, a lot of discussion over it. It's not so much whether it's thematic. I think people are generally saying it's thematic. And my songs are, all right, it's half and half. It's that Euro and Amerifrash distinction is getting debated yeah. a lot. I mean, I still think well, it's kind of you're, there's far too much rules going on in it for it to be an Amerifrash Amer yeah. in it because it's like so many over complicated rules it's like uh, it's like you know i just want to play a card have an effect and move my guy on the map or something it's like nope it's it's slavery with extra steps you know we, we gotta do <laughs> <laughs> now if this game was the same theme but when you got into combat you rolled a bunch of dice then it would be not a euro descent. But the fact that, yeah. yeah, but the fact that the combat is absolutely 100% deterministic, you know, you, is assuming you see the enemies in advance, then you can work it out. It is a maths puzzle. It is a maths puzzle to work mm. out how you're going to do it with the cards that you've got. Um, yeah, 
and and and, and yeah. that's basically it. I think that's I think that's the other thing that irks me with it or something. I mean, it's definitely like I say, it's deterministic. I would call it a Euro hands down. When I'm going for an adventure game, the last thing I want it to be though is is kind right. of like that. It's it's one of the reasons I didn't latch on to Gloomhaven because that one you sort of know what the enemies are going to do ahead of time and you mm -hmm. puzzle it out how to react. And it's like that's not how an adventure works. It's like right. the adventure for me is more the descent style thing of like right there's the enemies. I don't know what they're going to do. They yeah. could go after him. They come back after me. I'm going to try and hit it. I might not succeed. You know, or I might get that killer blow or something that you know, as a stand up seat moment. But as soon as I've got to knuckle down and go, right, how do I solve this puzzle? It's like, well, hang on a minute. This is the wrong kind of game. I shouldn't be doing right. that. Because even, even something like uh, Lord of the Rings and Mansion of the Madness or something, you know, I mean, that's got mm -hmm. dice. That one's got the card flipping thing. So there's an, an element of like the tactics and strategy. But yeah. at the end of the day, you're still going through the adventure to try and discover stuff and follow a story. I forgot what the story was in Mage Knight when I was playing it. Well, all there the times I have played one. it, but yeah. Well, well, yeah, there, there isn't really that explains story. it yeah <laughs> i mean you, you've been sent there and you've got to try and conquer the cities it's there's there's not really any <laughs> actual story there it is just a game of getting mm. the most points yeah. i think that's the thing yeah it's kind of like i went into it with like right go on, give me a fantasy adventure it's like oh <laughs> it's like there's no story but i don't think no. people are gonna like i say, I've, i don't think this would be like a hated one from a lot of people or something just personally but <laughs> i don't know it, it just didn't sit with me i mean i love through the ages shavato and dungeon pets you know he's done some stuff i really do like but yeah this was one that just like <laughs> it goes down in the infamous uh section okay day right you're number four and now before we gotta get onto some crossover soon otherwise we'll be on our night but it's well, only been one of them so far there has only been one, and this one ain't going to be a crossover, I can tell you that, because I bet you have not played this one. This is basically, the way I describe this to people is my version of basically Harry Potter the Euro game, because this is your quintessential Euro game for a wizard's academy, in a sense. You've, you know, you want to be the dean of this university, and, you, you know, the committee, you're not entirely certain what they want from one but in argon the consortium you're trying to impress them all but in here everything i mean it's level 99 games which they're typically pretty good on the whole thematic front but here your character from a particular school of magic so you know you could be very good at like the divination spells uh, you could be a, like a combat mage you know they're all different your workers are these different mages like your students and each one's got a special power depending on what type of mage it is so the red ones zap people out of the rooms the yellow the blue ones can kind of teleport all over the place uh, you, you can get like different gemstones and magic items you're collecting mana you're leveling up spells you start off on basic level you could grab a ton of spells or just make one spell stupidly powerful so one minute it's like oh it just creates a stiff breeze the other one it creates a cyclone and takes out the entire room of people or something because like, you can create some ridiculous like chaotic uh, things in here but there isn't a dice to be found anywhere it's pure euro it's just uh, quite a lot i mean there's a lot going on heavy wise but everything just makes me feel like this is an anime harry potter because i mean the artwork is that anime style but the, all the different rooms have got different effects you know your alchemist lab does this your senate room does this your sports ground perhaps or whatever does this all the spells feel unique everybody's doing something different even just what students you get i mean i'll take a bunch of the red mages so that i can zap you all out of the rooms you know a little bit of a aggression but i also like the hidden side of the victory condition which is trying to appease this consortium up here because one will say you gotta have the most mana or you gotta have the most followers of this particular spell score or have the most spells etc but you have to do actions during the game to actually find out in secret what they want. And it's whoever gets the most votes at the end is the winner. So you've got hidden information that the other players don't have, but you're looking at what the other players are doing, kind of think, well, somebody's really like trying to get a lot of gold over there. Is that because you want all the magic items or because gold is one of the key things I want to do? It just ah uh, comes well. It, I think it's the only game I've got that's kind of even anywhere close to this theme. Heavy mm. as you like. I don't know what this is here. It's like some of the weird components and that. And like I say, it's a bit of a nightmare to learn. There's a lot of effects going off, but there's a group of us who love playing this one. So I've played it mm -hmm. once, and it wasn't a good experience. Because <laughs> the person that's... teaching it didn't do a very good job, and we were all a bit confused, and we didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. But 
if I was to make a list of five games that I've played once and really want to play again, mm. this is one of them. Because I've not heard, only heard you talking about this. This is, this is a game which I think a lot of people in the chat might have never heard of. But the well, people Leslie, I one. know who have heard <laughs> of it say it's really good. But it is quite heavy. There is a lot going on. Uh, from what I remember, the board is like sprawling and there's stuff everywhere. Yeah. So it looks it looks daunting and it looks chaotic. Theme wise, uh, I, I again my my vague memory of playing it was like this actually does feel like your wizards learning spells and things like this, and it and it it all fit together. Now you said it was a pure euro, and I agree with you. There isn't any dice or anything like that, and all of the mechanisms of this game are euro. But one of the things that euro games have as a as a general trait is low player interaction. And mm. this game, from what I has remember, a <laughs> has a lot. Now that's good, because yeah. I love Kalos 1303, which is a Euro game with a lot of player interaction. It's not, um, it's not that I don't want player interaction. I love player interaction. I just don't like direct conflict player interaction in a Euro. And in this game, there was, isn't there one particular piece that can push out another piece or assassinate them or something like well, that. Well yeah, the the red the red mages can zap if you know a lower level like person out there and they go to the infirmary. Right. You get a little bonus, but you've got to be aware that a red mage can come by and do that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Don't definitely want to play this again, as I say. When did it come out? What year did it come out? Ooh. Because that was the year when I probably played it. 2015. And I've oh, got feels the expansion like this is, and I've got the expansion to That's this. That's only as six well. years yeah. ago. I thought like it was about 10 years, years ago. But wow, okay. Yeah, it's been a long time since I played it because half the time it gets played by the group I'm aware of or something, like they're playing it together and I'm doing something else. But yeah, I need right. to get this out. It's, is, it, it is, have it, a... is it Matthew and Hannah that have got it? Uh, Matthew and Gemma have got it. Um, Sorry, Gemma. Yeah. Ma yeah, Matt and Gemma have got it. I've got yeah. it. You know, and, you know, there's a couple of others in the group yeah. that... I think I think they've it, but... mentioned it to me themselves as well as as they really like it. So it's it's I, I don't know if it's Matt's favorite. I think it's yeah possibly his favorite like all might be one. time one, which is fair enough. I mean I love it the bits. It's a nine for me. It's just like I right. mean I'd have to completely reread the rules now to do it. Yeah. Although someone joked dirty or something like the the biggest challenge here or something. It's like uh, Paul's got to teach Luke Mage Knight properly or something. No it's problem. Like, it's I can teach like... you that in my sleep. I mean, I go a bit like that would be interesting. You teach me Mage Knight, but in return, I teach you Argent. That could work. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's not fair on you, because I want to play Argent, and I am pretty sure I will like it. You're going into Mage Knight. In fact, it's not mm. fair on me. You're going to Mage Knight already <laughs> with a hatred of it, and I've somehow got to change your mind. Yeah. So. True. Yeah. <laughs> True. I suppose. But yeah, I'm always. <laughs> Sometimes I can be convinced. But ah, well, fine. All right, top three. We need more crossovers if we're going to get on this one. <laughs> Right, so number three, and I'll just repeat what we said at the start, is that this is 10 games, not necessarily in the right order, but I had to quickly go through and give each one of them a unique number. <laughs> but number three on my list is Terraforming Mars. And this right. is another one which <laughs> sort of surprised me, and I sort of think, actually, should Terraforming Mars be on this list? Should it, should it be higher? than some of the other ones that I've already mentioned on this list. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, and I will admit, I did look at the list provided to me by my Patreon supporters, and Terraforming Mars was listed by about eight or nine people as an extremely thematic game. And that, that confirmed to me that I was right with my gut feeling of, mm. is this really a thematic game or not? And then when I started thinking about it, I was like, yeah. So first of all, let's talk high level. Let's talk high level about what the game actually is and what you're doing in the game. Do you feel in the game that you are gradually, over the course of 250 years, terraforming a planet? Yes, you Just. do. You do. Then let's look down at the macro detail. Do I feel when I play a card that's got a name that costs 35 mega credits? that increases my heat production by seven, do I feel like I have produced a giant magnifying glass space mirror in space and I'm focusing it to the planet? And the answer for me is yes. 
that for I, me is a no. Right. I on. absolutely love the fact that every single card in this game, when you look at it, it has the effect that you think it would have. And as I've come to learn to love terraforming Mars more, I've come across things in the game. So I, I, I grew up wanting to be, uh, well, I was doing astrophysics at university. I've always had an interest in astronomy and science and planets and things like that. But when playing Terraforming Mars, I was like, oh, what, what's this card? You know, and it, it's like some random thing about GHG gases. And I'm like, I don't understand what this is. So I actually started Googling it and I started looking up some scientific information about some of the things in Terraforming Mars. And I'm like, they've got this spot on. They've, they've actually got this right. The fact that the things that you do in the game and the card effects in the game are actually based on real science that we know now. And that is what definitely made me put it on this list is not the fact that it's, it is thematic, but if we compare it to Spirit Island, I felt that Spirit Island was thematic because that's how I imagine it would be. So much of Terraforming Mars is actually based on science fact at the moment mm. that I felt, yeah, def definitely thematic for me. You know, even the end of the game, yeah. when the, the game ends, when you have terraformed the planet and the terraforming the planet is based on actual science that we know now of the three parameters that would be needed for the planet to be habitable. You know, all of that stuff, all of that science research and stuff has been done and it's been turned into a game. So, yeah. I just say, space I mean, mirror says Jill. Yes, giant yeah. space mirror. <laughs> it's got the, it's got the, I mean, it's got some theme. I mean, yeah, okay, I do feel like I'm terraforming a planet. I just didn't get a lot of that out of the cards, though. So, right. you know, I can play a card, and it's like it ups on this. Tra and I, I think the problem is because it's a lot of tracks. Yeah, tracks is a very hard thing to keep as a, a thematic thing. It's like I play this card, it ups this and creates a lake and i get five terraform rating i forget exactly what that's yep. supposed to represent in that and it's kind of like okay fine and by the time you've played like a, about 100 cards over the course of the game they all sort of blur in and i don't feel like as much as i can sort of go it's helped by prelude i'll admit you know you've, yep. you've got to put prelude in there you yeah, need that absolutely. player differentiation but even with Prelude, I'm sort of like thinking, right, when I look at all my cards, I think, right, how am I different from the other players? It's difficult to spot it unless it's a case of, oh, I'm higher up on this track than someone else. Because I'll look at my cards and they feel like a random assortment of stuff. Right. So, you know, I take a look at this like, person here, this could be my thing. And oh, actually, this is a bad example because it's the wrong language. but Because it's know, in French. It's, uh, <clears throat> yeah. it's all right. We speak French. But I mean, you know, a droid miner, a droid miner here, you know, a colony here, an asteroid here, and then like a yep. dog, a dog here or something. When you're like playing pets, and it's like, how do they link? I don't know, but you don't necessarily find yourself playing a card because it fits. Oh yeah, I'm the plant person. That's what I'm going for. It's more I'm yeah. playing this card. It's totally unrelated to what I really am doing thematically, but it gets me points, and I'm starting to go down more of a mechanical route with it. Yeah, I mean, each individual card on its own is thematic, but you don't mm. all. It's not like, it's not like, oh, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a dwarf barbarian, and therefore <laughs> I'm not allowed to game. play a spell. <laughs> your your particular mm. corporation that you have in the game doesn't mean that that's your personality trait, and that you should be playing cards of that particular theme. You you can play whatever card you want. Um, it's just, I, I think. Again, the, these lists that we've come up with, these are subjective. Yeah. And I think for me, I am slightly biased towards Terraforming Mars because like like I said earlier on when I talked about Feast for Odin, it's you just it. so enjoyable to play. I just play a game of Terraforming Mars and look, I'm doing cool stuff. Look, I've built a giant... Sp look, I've just crashed an... I've, I've dragged an asteroid from Jupiter and I've crashed it into the planet, which has released GHG gases, which has increased the temperature. You know, that's scientifically correct. But I've just done that and I've done this. Oh, and I also did this. Uh, and I've got this little wildlife reserve where we're growing all of these, these animals over the, right. Oh, the game's over, add up the points. Oh, this person's won, whatever. And it, it doesn't matter. You know, look at what I've done. And I think that that is why Terraforming Mars is such a popular game is because playing it is enjoyable because every player is doing something and every player is able to build their own engine and do cool stuff. 
and then you add up the points at the end and one player's done better than another but everybody's enjoyed the process of doing it um yeah so Ish. yeah but <laughs> is it that i've warmed up to it a bit more than i used to but it's still kind of on the average thing for me it's like i've got to play it with a max of three players and it's got to have prelude otherwise i just don't enjoy it because it just drags on yeah. forever <laughs> prelude <laughs> definitely yeah um i'm 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 I, I play three and four players uh the thing is with the the play time doesn't go up that much because with five players you actually end up playing fewer generations whereas if you play with three players you will play a lot more generations that's so it game... kind of yeah, but that's game rounds, though. It still takes forever to get through those generations because right, you've okay. got to wait for four people that's to true. AP like crazy over that, their that turns. Is true. <laughs> like, that is true. And I've had three players take three hours because of finding one min max oh, right. before. It's okay. like it, it can it can happen. But I mean, it's like, right, Prelude shortens the game and differentiates you. Fantastic. Yep. Auto include. Three players is about the length where it's like, okay, this game will actually probably finish, hopefully, in 90 minutes with Prelude. Yeah. Otherwise, because it is just basically a drafting game at the end of the day with extra bits on yeah. it. So there's only so long you want to keep drafting per se. Like I said, I'm, I've warmed up to it a little bit more, but it's a, I've got to play it in a specific way. Personally, I'm more interested in getting a play of that Ares Expedition one because even though that's probably less thematic than this one, it will be quicker and still it's give quicker. me a similar feel. Yeah, yeah. I, I have played um, Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. I did a uh, a Patreon video have, yeah. playthrough the other the other week. If, if slightly off topic, there's a number of people who prefer Ares Expedition, and for them, it's replaced Terraforming Mars. Having now played Ares Expedition, I liked it. It captures the feel of Terraforming Mars, but I want the detail. I want mm. the map. I want those things. I want all of that. Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition is basically Race for the Galaxy with Good, a Terraforming yeah. Mars theme. And it, it does capture a lot of the theme, mm. but it, it, it's missing out on a lot of other yeah. stuff. So I think I think that length aspect is what's going to make me probably prefer Ares. If, if length is like... an issue, then then mm. Ares Expedition is... is if, you, if you don't hate Race for the Galaxy mechanisms, if you quite like Race for the Galaxy mechanisms... I like them, yeah. Then, uh, then Ares Expedition is, is, is definitely the, the, the game for you. Fair news. Milky Duck. All right. Number two. Have I, was it? No, what you're number three. Space? Fuck off. Freeze. All right. Three. This is going to be a long one, ball. I'm sorry. You're just going to have to okay. deal with it. Um, no, not the game. I mean the stream. Oh, that's uh, fine. But... That's why starting at eight means we're, we're okay. Good point. Yeah. Because <laughs> you were afraid about getting midnight. Right. Uh, this one. This, I think we discussed this one previously. So I'd be surprised if it doesn't end up on your list. Although I, I'm surprised it would be this high. Well, there's only personally. two left on my list. I know, but it's like if it's your one and two, then fair play. I mean, it is my number three at the end of the day. But people will debate forever as to whether this is a Euro. It still feels like a Euro to me, but it is definitely one of the more thematic Euro games out there with all the scenarios, even though this is also one of the hardest games in existence. <laughs> Robinson Crusoe, people are going to debate forever as to whether this is a Euro or not. I personally it's a hybrid. think it... It's a, it, it can be a hybrid. It can be a hybrid one, but I think it leans more towards the Euro in the yeah. sense that, yes, it's co-op, but, you know, the card play, your action selection, the map and that, you know, there is a bit of dice rolling. Yeah, but then, I, as I say, this is like so borderline on that hybrid level, it's hard to push it one way or the other. But I just think there's enough going on in it with the resource gathering and feeding yourself and all that lot that it just caters over that Euro part of it so it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the chat thinks on that but it's definitely fanatic one way or the other i mean whichever scenario you are playing swiss family robinson or go save jenny or cannibals or indiana jones volcano it feels exactly like that even the expansion i grabbed felt a bit like a you know a more horror themed like survival story in a sense but mm -hmm. the card system in this where you know where you find you know, you go find some berries and you think, you know what, I do need food rather desperately. I'm going to eat some berries. I'll eat them. Ah, good. I got some food. In the deck it goes. And then later on, it comes out and bites you. Yep. Very few other games do that. And I think this mechanic needs to be copied a lot more because it creates its own little mini stories, you know, as well as everything else. But the fact that, you know, you've got to level up these cards, you know, you start off with basic tools, you've got to level them up to get the other ones. There's... I get what like some people are saying. I mean, there is like somebody saying like, oh, yeah, the dice are so deterministic in a sarcastic manner. It's like I get it. Yeah, dice are not. They are. Yeah. The first thing you'd point to in a euro, but I mean, you can have a little bit of 
you know, randomness in a year. It doesn't need to be devoid of it. And you say the dice are mitigatable, as Kabuki says. Yeah. So it, as I say, this is definitely a like, like middle of the road thing. And I was contemplating putting it lower on the list because of it, but it's just so from. Oh, Luke seems to have frozen. I don't know if you can still hear me. Luke's definitely frozen, which means the stream might have frozen. I don't know. Maddie, um, it's just but... one giant story. Oh, he's story. back. It's, it's, yeah, that's all right. It's, yeah, I could hear you fine. It, it, I think it's oh, right, okay. a blip in the uh, internet. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. We're good. But yeah, I, I've, I think I've said all I need to say on that. So it's... to be honest, you, I we... also think Robinson Crusoe is more Euro mm. than the other end of the scale. Sure, there is the randomness of the dice. For me, when I've played it, and I've played it a few times, it's not just the randomness of the dice either. If on scenario one, you don't find a place with a good enough shelter in the first three turns, you can't win the game. You just, you're just completely screwed. So actually, the look of the draw on the exploration tiles is massive. Putting that aside, this should have probably been on my list because it is extremely thematic. Um, and this is a game with a lot of rules. You know, I worked on the rule book for this, for the new version of the game. There's a lot of rules in there. Um, this was a case of, you know, Ignacy's sort of subtitle is board games that tell stories. Yeah. When you are playing this game, you are telling a story. Now, I've played this game five, six times. And whilst I feel that it is a little bit too random for me, it does have a lot of choices and it does have decisions that you need to make. There is a little bit too much random for me, but the fact that it's a cooperative game, and I have loved every single game I've played of this, because it tells a story. I never forget one game where, because in the game, I think if, if one player dies, you lose as a group. Yeah, It isn't one of these ones where you carry on playing. If one player dies as a group, you lose. Yeah, there's no Lone Ranger. No, and two people went out gathering and left two people back at base camp. One of them was trying to build like a tent and the other one was doing some cooking. Those characters that were left at base camp had an argument, <laughs> killed each other <laughs> because we only had one wound left each. And the card said, two players have an argument, they deal one damage to each other. So the people who came back from gathering basically came back with a whole load of wood and went, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what's happened to Paul and Sue? And it was just hilarious. Right? Yeah, it... And that was a random draw of a random card that killed us because of randomness. And if you don't like randomness in the game, then you're, you're not going to like it because we'd been playing the game for two and a half hours. We got a bad card draw. But as a story, it was hilarious. Yeah. It, was, it was brilliant. And again, it's a cooperative game. It told a good story. It was fun to play. And it kind of didn't matter the fact that we lost on the on the flip of a card because you can lose yeah you can lose euro games on the flip of a card sometimes it's just well, so yeah it's it is very thematic it's a it's a narrative game that doesn't have a narrative because it's just the setting you're the, the one actually yeah. saying oh this is the like the story that happens the game doesn't have a story that you play in a scenario it's just here's the setting go yeah and yeah. then you, you, you don't radically. have a card that says <laughs> what's going on but yeah. as you say, you tell the story. It's day one. Luke's mm. gone off looking for things and he found a tiger and he came running back into camp and whatever. Mm. And, and then the storm hit at night and we lost our shelter. Nothing in the game has that narrative element. Mm. You make that narrative element yourself. Now, yeah, the, yeah. the adventure cards that you get does have the narrative element on them. And the but first then... time I ever played the game um, was brilliant because I got bit by a spider. And then it says, shuffle this card into the deck. Now, once you've played this game a lot it loses a little bit of the mystery because you know exactly what that card does. Mm. But the it first never, it, time it does, you it, play it, this it, game... It doesn't hit the table anywhere near enough to remember yeah, the cards. But the, yeah. the first time you play the game, you should not look at... You should read the bit that say, character gets bit by the spider. Don't look at the bottom bit. Shuffle yeah. the card into the deck mm. because then when the card comes out, it is a surprise and it, and it, and it tells the story. Yeah, um, I never read the bottom. Right. But yeah, it works. I'll be bit by a spider. I think I would just died at that point. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, you want you want clear proof that is like board game stories. I 
you're gonna have to search it on YouTube, but find a Dice Tower video they did at one of their cons where they taught Sam Healy how to play it for the first time. They had Ignacity there, Sam, Z, and Tom. Go find that video. It's on their YouTube somewhere, and it's like his first play of Robinson. Yes, they die because let's mm -hmm. face it, ninety nine five percent of the time you will die. Yep. But I have not seen a more funnier playthrough of any game in my life with what right. they have, what they do, how Tom is trying to like he's the chef, but he's trying to literally cook up everything that he finds in the adventure deck, no matter how bad it is. How you know Sam is just trying to get whatever weapons he can and go hunt down every creature. There's a monkey that comes around that's trying to steal their <laughs> stuff, and he's like, first thing I want to do is shoot it. It's just like it's it's one of the funniest playthroughs I've ever watched but it summarizes everything we've just said about it being you know a thematic experience but it's mm -hmm. gonna be i don't know i was debating that euro thing and that was the hardest thing but as soon as i was decided i'm calling it a euro right list hi i, I <laughs> so. think it's yeah i definitely think it is more on the euro side of it um even though there are yeah i mean there's there's so many mechanisms in it that are euro mm -hmm. mechanisms that yeah definitely yeah i think kabuki had a very good point actually because she said um that uh yes the dice aren't deterministic but you can mitigate it to the point where you can actually not roll the dice if you're willing to do yeah but you'll lose the game if you do that true yeah you gotta take a chance every now and again but like yeah. i say you, you choose and and even then you roll the dice it doesn't necessarily mean it, it's rare you fail the action you're doing when you roll the dice because there's only one mm -hmm. die that has the failure bit on it it's just more it's not so much oh i'm rolling this hoping i'll succeed it's more i'm rolling this hoping i don't take a wound or end yeah. up with an adventure card that's going to bite me later yeah, yeah so it's it's good with that, but yeah, right, twos. So number two on my list is a game from another one of my favorite designers. Um, and that is Vlade Trevatel again, but this time it's is Dungeon it Pets. I was going to say, if it's not Dungeon Pets, I would have called Serious <laughs> Foul because there is no other game by Vlade Trevatel even I would say through the ages might be pushing it, that would be, all right, this is your thematic choice. Yeah, Dungeon yeah. Pets fits. <laughs> so Through the Ages is one of my favourite games of all time. It's in my top three games of all time, and it's not on this list. Hmm. But Dungeon Pets is. Yeah. Dungeon Pets is, in my opinion, it is his most thematic game. Um, Hands down. The, the, the theme of the game, all of the mechanisms of the game, the way that everything fits together... I've literally written one, some of these other ones in my notes, I've written six or seven lines. This one, I've written one line because I've just put, I've just put everything. Yeah. <laughs> everything about this game is thematic. You, you have these pets. These pets start off as like little, little cute babies and they're, they're relatively easy to look after. But as they grow older, their needs become more. The, they get bigger, they get harder to look after. You're going to need to give them more food. You're going to need stronger cages to keep them in if they get angry. Um, they have different diets. Um, even, even the first bit, one of the phases in the game is where you basically, you, you, you create groups of imps to go shopping. So in the, in the first phase of each round, you cover up your, your, your player board with a little player screen and you arrange your imps into six different groups to go shopping. And a group can either be made up of imps and it could include gold, but you can't just create a group with just gold because gold can't go shopping on its own because it doesn't have any legs. It's a, it's a little funny rule. It's in the rule book. And I love teaching this game to people. I have demoed this game dozens of times to people at conventions. And it is, I'm going to say it's easy to teach. It's not because it's a heavy game, but it's easy to teach because I am constantly referring to the theme of the game and the humor in the theme of the game Mm. And it clicks. And one of the things that you can do in your game, if your pet gets angry, they will try to break out of their cage. So yeah. <laughs> if, if they have like four anger points and the cage only has a strength of two, they're going to break out of the cage. But because it's four minus two, because you're too short, you could use two of your imps to help keep the cage door closed, which means the pet stays inside but the pets then, mm. the, the imps then get injured and go to hospital. And it just yeah. <laughs> all fits. This is a completely fictional universe, but when you're playing the game and when you're teaching the game and when you're explaining mm. it and everything just... Works. <laughs> it just works. It just it, it just really works. It, 
it's a shame I couldn't put this on my list, but it's nothing to do with the theme or Euro side of things. It's like, yeah, hands down, it's Devil of Fadia. It's the fact that I only recall playing this once. Mm -hmm. And I think I liked it in a sense mechanically, but I do remember just falling in love with the theme, just joking about, yeah. oh, like, you know, your pets are regressive, yours are just pooping everywhere. Yeah. You know, the fact that you've got to deal with that. And and this was, I think this was quite early on. Like, this might have been one of the, like, first few heavy Euros I might have remembered playing, because I'm trying to think when... When did this one come out of all games? 2000 uh, and... Oh, don't tell me. Is it 2000 and... Yeah, I was going to say 2010, 2011. So, yeah. 2011. So, it... Yeah, this this one I remember playing quite early. And I think nowadays I'd probably like it more. I've almost been tempted to just buy it on a whim. But I have to say, I probably will at some point. Because, yeah, the more you talk about it, the more I remember it. Yeah, God, blimey, this was a formatic game. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> And it works on there. Someone's asked, uh, how's it different to, you yeah, know, Jill's asked, how's it different to Dungeon Lords in it's every way, shape, or form? It, it's a completely <laughs> different game. Yeah. To totally and utterly different game. They are set in the same universe. Thematically, um, every every evil Dungeon Lord needs a pet. So you, um, and basically, um, the theme of the game in Dungeon Pets is that you used to be. Uh, the goblins that helped out this evil dungeon lord, but the evil dungeon lord lost his license, so you were out of a job, so you decided to set up your pet shop to breed animals to sell to other dungeon lords. That's the only connection. Mechanically, yeah. they are completely different games. They're, yeah, the, they're, they're nothing alike in terms dun of mechanics. Dungeon Lords was not a win for me, I was saying. You, you had right. like 16 actions in the game, and it felt like one of those, a bit like the Mage Knight thing of like, this is a puzzle dressed yes. up like Dungeon Keeper. And it's absolutely that, a puzzle. Yeah. And people were thinking like, oh, yeah, I remember Dungeon Keeper. We used to play that. And it's just like, nope, this was a weird little puzzle with 16 actions. It just did not feel, it felt very clunky, that one. It was not right. a good one. But, but so I played Dungeon Pets, like thinking, right, this is going to be nothing like Lords. Let's blot out Lords. And thankfully it wasn't. Like, yeah. I mean, I've only got a seven here, but that's only because I rem I think I liked it more than, you know, like Mechanic and that. But I've only played it once. I feel yeah. like this is, this is one of those that, yeah, I need to get more plays of it. But nobody yeah. I know has it. So, okay. <laughs> Well, drop me a message afterwards. I'll see if I can. Uh, I'll see if I can pull some strings at CGE for you. So, <laughs> yeah, good, I mean, it, it, there's little things in this game. Like, there's a worker placement part of the game, and one of the worker placement spaces is where you go and get a new cage. Hmm. That worker placement space, uh, that that worker placement space, you have to send at least two imps hmm. because it's a cage, and you have to carry it back with you. And it's, you know, there's so many little thematic reasons work. in the game for every mm. again comparing it a little bit like to mage knight there's lots of fiddly little rules in this game and lots of little exceptions but every single one has a thematic explanation yeah. that might have um, been the thing because i remember there being quite a lot of like oh blimey there's a lot of these little fiddly bits to remember but i sort of yeah. glossed over because i thought this could have easily just been i mean i'd play a euro game about running a zoo but yeah. you've got a zoo, which is imps and weird creatures with all oh. sorts of strange, like all sorts. I mean, you joke so much. Oh, I mean, that's uni. Look at uni. Why, why do I? Why do I feel like I remember playing this game with Matt and Gemma, and Gemma going mad over the unicorn? Something just reminds me of that. But yeah, yeah just birdie, all these creatures. Bolly. That I can remember if there was a spider one in here that I thought like I'm not having that's that Cthulhu. Just under that's under, stair plants. Oh, oh, Cthulhu. Yes, I remember. But, Cthulhu. But there's, yeah, that's, there's that's so Cthulhu. many of these. <laughs> yes, I had the there, there you go. <laughs> I thought I gotta have that the, the were rabbit. That's, that's awesome. yeah. so, oh, I need to get this one back. All right, it's, we'll see. it's such a good game, and it's it's absolutely a euro because of the way that those coloured yeah. bars work. Is that you can see ahead of time what the needs are going to be of that particular pet. So when you decide to buy them from the market, you're looking and you're saying, okay, well, right now it's only a yellow and a green bar, but I know that over time it's going to be three yellows, two greens, and two reds. So you already yeah. know what kind of pet it's going to be. And the really clever card play where you actually determine the specific yeah. needs of the pet, it's just, it's just yeah. great. And it, it tells such a, such a hilarious story. You, you're looking after the pet and you're going, right, so Cthulhu, first of all, he gets a little bit hungry, but I don't have any food for him. So he gets angry and he tries to break out of his cage. Uh, and, and then he does this. And then, you know, when you tell this little story mm. about each of the pets, yeah, the story really of nice. and then I thought like I got no food. Fine, have this imp. You know, it's like yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's like it's. I was gonna fire him anyway. Fine, it's like <laughs> it, oh yeah, oh, I need to get it back and I need to get it back at it. Right, yeah. uh, it was two so I'm at two. Right, two. we've only got three games left to talk about, and we've only had one crossover. 
Well, yeah. everyone's been begging for more crossovers in the chat. Well, it's okay. I haven't got to talk very much about this one because we kind of went over it in detail. Yep, here we go. It's another crossover. Of course, Anachrony is on my list. I mean, yeah, come I on. <laughs> <laughs> Anachrony <laughs> had to make my list. I mean, we we already talked about the loan system which is just like the best use of time travel because time travel yeah. is so hard to represent in a board game and as soon as i got explained that it's everything just clicked like i knew i'm gonna like this game it's gonna happen and yes jen you called it i think probably half the chat <laughs> called it if not everyone else <laughs> but even that i mean you, the fact you can only go outside if you get in the mech so yes yeah. you've got all these people but you've only got so many mechs and then you know i need the water to to wake people up and do stuff but then i need the factories to time travel you've got the production buildings and it will and then even when the i mean you can play the expansion to sort of tell when the meteor is going to hit i don't tend to play mm -hmm. that because i think the game's complex enough already without throwing yeah. any expansions in but except for fractures of time i do like that but where instead of time travel now you're blinking in and out of reality is if you need yeah. any more reasons to mess the the core nexus up but even with this it's like you're gearing up for that event it happens the board state flips and suddenly it's like oh right now we are actually doing you know the evacuation and the game You've crescendos to, yep. to the end it works so well on the thematic basis like nothing in here feels like it wasn't designed with a thematic thing in check yeah and people will make references to the like the faction they're doing i mean i love being the squid dudes because like every all your mechs basically look like mini cthulhu's which yep. is <laughs> always great but then the last one of my favorite buildings that I've had twice now, I had it in the last game I played, is you can get several buildings that give you water at different rates. Mm -hmm. But I love the building. That, that means, because normally you put a worker in a building to trigger it. Sometimes yeah. it might be free, but normally it has a worker and sometimes they wake up afterwards or sometimes they don't. This is a building that gets you a ton of water, but it kills the person who goes yeah. in it. You basically <laughs> liquefy the person for water. And if you've ever watched Tank Girl, it's basically that. So I've... I had that last time, and I'm just joking constantly. Like, uh, I'm all right with the water. Oh, I'm a bit short on water. Hello, side it liquefies. <laughs> I yep. just, uh, just toss him in there. Like, I'm a bit short on water. Would anyone mind getting Steve and just shoving him into the liquefier? <laughs> and Steve's like, oh, not again. <laughs> well, no, it's like, what's the recruitment process like for your firm? It's like short life expectancies, but, uh, yeah. you know, the right person can go to the top. The, 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 the wrong person can get liquefied. It's like, the employees secretly like it. It's like, I don't know. It's it's, it can tell its own little story, but come blimey, yeah. yeah. If, if I didn't have this on my list, I think I'd, I'd have to resign from gaming. It's like it had to happen. I, I thought it would be on your list. I just wasn't <laughs> sure. I wasn't sure how high. So, I mean, the thing is, we've talked before about uh, a thematic game represents reality and what it would be like. David is yeah. actually from the future. David Turtsy is actually from the future. He knows this happened. So, Designing this game was easy for him because it's basically that that was his life before he came back in time to spend time with us. Who were with that? Uh, Paul's as I say, Paul's as we'll try it any good solo. It is pretty good solo. There's three Better solo with, variants. There is. It's. <sighs> It's fine solo with the base game. It gets better if you get the Chronosis and the improved bot in the expansion. Yeah. The only problem is, once you get that, you are then playing a very... I mean, as if the base game isn't complex enough, you are playing ultra complex mode. Yeah. But it's not that the base game has a bad solo mode. It's just once you've played the new versions, you can see what changed. But now it's, it's pretty good solo. I've played it solo a few times. But actually, this is one of those that I kind of prefer to play almost like prefer to play with like you know a couple of extra people just because yeah. i want to see what everyone does and there is that you know tension for the spaces the interaction and everyone feels very different so yeah definitely a great one yeah. okay right the moment you've been waiting for chaps we're on to two crossovers so far so paul's current <clears throat> paul guessed two i guessed three and the chat Ooh. was all over the shop so I so mean, basically so if we have a different number one, then I, I, I win the guess how many crossovers we've got. And yeah. I am I am 99% sure. I will bet you a, a pack of Jaffa Cakes. What is my number one is not your number one. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty positive my number one's not your number one. So it's, so, it's going to come down to whether it's... Uh, let's see. You're not going to guess what this is. Well, you haven't given me a clue. What am I supposed to do? No, <laughs> because this is this is very different from a lot of the other ones on the list. But whenever anybody asks me to give them a definition of a thematic Euro, I always it's... say Flam Rouge. Oh, I was good. Okay. 
I mean, I can I can get it, but number one. <laughs> yep. Now I've put it. I've put it number one. Whether it should be number one or not, because it is Dungeon Pets more thematic than Flam Rouge, possibly. Yes. But Flam Rouge <laughs> for me. Again, I might be slightly biased because Flam Rouge is such a good game because it's a great gateway game. It's easy to teach, but when you are playing Flam Rouge, the way that the mechanisms work. And again, this I think it's unfair to compare it to Dungeon Pets because Dungeon Pets is a heavy, complex game with a thousand rules, most of which are thematic. Flam Rouge is a light game. It's not even a medium game. Flam Rouge is a light game. Therefore, yeah. there are a lot less rules, but the rules that are in there are very thematic. So first of all, the way that the card system works is brilliant and it's a genius the fact yeah. that when you have a deck of cards you play a card that's that card gone mm. basically as the game goes on you will be removing cards from your deck which represents the fact that your rider is getting tired and they're getting more exhausted if you end up at the front of one of the the groups you will take an exhaustion card because you're you're at the head so mm. therefore, you're getting affected by the wind and the people behind you are getting the bit of the slipstream. So therefore, you get the exhaustion cards, which, which are very thematic. The way that the rules for the hills work are the, the simple rules. You know, if you're going up a hill, the maximum speed you can go is five. Mm. So if you play a card of seven, it's reduced to a five. Whereas if you're going downhill, the minimum speed is five. And it's just it's yeah. so simple rules, but it fits. It works very thematically. Now, Looking at it from a, a higher level, I am not into cycling. I do not watch the Tour de France. I do not watch, I'm not interested in that whatsoever. Yeah. But I have spoken to people who know how the Tour de France works and how cycle races works. And I've explained to them mechanically how this game works. And they went, that's exactly how it works. Each rider has a choice. They have a certain amount of energy which is basically represented in the game by the cards and the different numbers on the cards. And they choose when they want to push and when yeah. they don't want to push. And that is represented in the game by, oh, do I want to play the seven or do I want to play the three? And the way that the game plays out is that you end up with these little clumps and you get people playing the low cards early on in the game and staying together in these clumps. But you don't want to be at the head because then you'll get the exhaustion yeah. cards. So you kind of want to be within the group at the front to get the slipstream. Yeah. And then at some point, somebody will make a break for it. Yeah. And I've played this game with uh, a non-gamer who was really into the Tour de France. And at the end of the game, they went, this is exactly how it, it yeah. plays out. I, um, I, I really need somebody to paint my flam rouge. <laughs> I, 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 I painted mine. I've just finished them. God. Yeah, last year. I hate looking at this like boring plastic. I want my flam rouge. Like, yeah. I have not got this out in so long, actually. It st stayed in the collection mainly because I know that when I get it out, I'll love it because I still yeah. think it is a really solid game. And I, I can admit, no one, pre I don't think anyone predicted this. I mean, it was the Simpson quote. No, I, well, I, 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 no, I don't think anybody expected him to say that. Like, no, <laughs> nobody expected me to say this, but anybody who was, anybody who stalks me, and has listened to me over the last few years, whenever yeah. thematic Euros gets mentioned, Flam Rouge is always the first one that I mention. Um, it's mm. just the first one that always comes to mind. Uh, and, and as I yeah. say, yeah, whether it should be number one on my list, I I, I don't know, but I, I, I've put it in there as number one. Um, and yeah, it's yeah a... e even the slipstreaming rules, you slipstream if you are close to the people in front, but if you're two spaces away, you don't slipstream. And it's just, yeah, that's that's exactly how it would be. And it's just, yeah, everything just fits. Yeah, it, it, uh, I can, uh, I gotta get this one out again. But yeah, it does actually work. I mean, I would never have expected it. I probably wouldn't have stuck it at one. But no, I can mm -hmm. see this being a thematic year. I didn't even, I did, I'm not even sure if it made my shortlist. I think it just didn't crop to my mind. But yeah, as soon as you mention it, it's like, yeah, that works. That works. That works. Yeah, yeah. hang on. These are why I like the game. It's like, <laughs> I need and to as try I say, I think, I think, I I think a lot of people are parents. surprised that it's number one because there aren't that many rules in the game. Period. Yeah. But the ones that are there, I think, are extremely thematic.
No, that's that's say that's definitely a good surprising one. It, it def if I'd thought of it, yeah, it definitely would have been easily easily made the shortlist. It definitely works. Do you prefer this? Somebody mentioned RV Caesar earlier. I mean, I don't, I haven't played RV Caesar. I play Downforce now. But do you prefer this to Downforce? So I've not played Downforce, and I last played RV Caesar in the eighties. Hmm. Yeah, Ave Caesar is when when I mean I've I've had discussion about racing games for for various various times over the last few years. The other popular racing game that always gets mentioned is Snow Tales, which and I've a lot of people room, seem to think either Flam Rouge or Snow Tales is 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 the best racing game. Um, but yeah, I've I've not played yeah. Downforce, and as I say, Ave Caesar. I, I mean, I know people that still play it now. I don't know whether they still play it because it's a good game or for nostalgia reasons. They're kind um, of similar, really. Downforce and Ave Caesar are similar enough. Okay. I mean, like I've kept one, but I mean, yeah, Downforce, Snow Tails, and Flam Rouge. Yeah, they're definitely, I think, my top trio of racing games. And then sort of mm. just coming up slightly behind it, just because it's a little bit harder to get to the table, is Automobiles Beyond My Head. I do, I, yeah. I do love a good racing game, and yeah, Snow Tails is definitely a good. One yeah, some, like, I mean, somebody said in the chat, racing games are not their thing. Racing games are not my thing. I, I, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> have said that racing games are, yeah. are something which I enjoy playing. It's because Flam Rouge is just, it's so accessible. There's so much good game there in such a short period of time. Um, and it, and it, it's really, really thematic that I just, yeah, really mm. like it. Um, I mean, Flam Rouge is not normally a solo game as one person has at, but if you get the no. Peloton expansion, it does have a solo mode in it. Although, funny enough, I have yet to try it. I, I haven't tried that, it either. I should yeah. make that a, a personal point, actually, because I'm trying a few random solo modes out. Like I did the, the print and play for Whistle Mountain recently, so I'm trying to get a few random solo modes. And Well, I hope yeah, the rules are clear when you come to read them, because I wrote those solo rules. So What, what for Peloton? Yeah. Oh, good. Right. Well, at least I know I'm not in for a hard time then. <laughs> well, I hope so. Cross fingers. That's fine. Okie doke. Uh, 221. The big one. Right. The big one, number one. Is it Flam Rouge? It is not. Cool. Blimey. That would be a surprise. <laughs> no. However, however, I win the crossover thing because oh! this one is a crossover. This is num <laughs> This is the third crossover. Hang on. Let me, let me see if I can guess yeah. what it is. Right. Go on. Let's see. Go on, chat. Help him out with this one. What? So. It's not I mean, Mage Knight. I'll, I'll, I'll say quickly now, I've not played Shakespeare. I want to play Shakespeare. So, you know, at some point, hopefully. And mm. I'll, and Tricarion would not make my list for two reasons. Firstly, I didn't want to put too many games from the same publisher on there. And yep. secondly, as much as Tricarion is basically the prestige in a, in a board game. Which is awesome. You think, yeah, which is awesome. Underrated movie. But when you think about how the magic tricks work in that game with that and the theater puzzle thing, it's like... Hmm, that's not the most thematic element of it. <laughs> yeah, so Trickerian was on my short list, hmm. but then I dropped it off because there are... The setting of Tri Trickerian is fantastic, hmm. but thematic hmm. connection mechanically... is not as strong. Some of, some of it works really well. I love the way that you, you go to the market, they don't have the rope, can I order it in to arrive next week? Yeah, hmm. I, I love that. But for me... There are a few parts of Trickerian which really don't work thematically, and that's why it dropped off my list. Anyway, so yeah, it's, not that, it's not that, it's not that, it's yeah, not that, it's not that. I'm looking at the chat. Everyone's thinking Kanban, but I already said that. No, you've already said Kanban. You've already said Anachrony. Yeah, those two we've already crossed. So there's eight others. Oh, it can't be that because you, you didn't. No one in chat. It's not Lisboa it from your reaction, unless you're bluffing me. It's definitely not that. Right. It's either Lisboa and you were bluffing, or it's Agricola, but I think you said no. No, it wouldn't, wouldn't be that because I put Fields of Arl is effectively exactly. my Agricola. And it wouldn't be Dungeon Pets because you said you haven't played that for ages and you want to play it again. And you've already uh, played the... it once, so. The list, the list, somebody asked for the list. I say, I said, what, Paul, Paul's list was, was it? He had Agricola, Kanban, Agricola, Anachrony, Kanban, Brass, Brass, Lisboa, Lisboa Spirit, Spirit Island, Island, Mage Knight, Mage Terraforming Mars, Mars, Dungeon Pets, Mars, and Flam Rouge. I don't know. As, that, and look, as I read that out, it's like, yeah, it should be having, although it took a while for the chat to get on. And of course, somebody said Obsession. That would have been amusing, actually, if it was your own. You've been mentioned. bluffing me. No, I, I can't I, work out which one it is. I did bluff slightly. I did try to taper my expectations, but Jen, Jen, you were the first person to get it. Of course, it is Spirit Island. <laughs> right, okay. 
<laughs> Spirit Island number one. I mean, everything you said is basically spot on, but I mean, I could okay. go even more fanboyish over like half of the theme in this game. This this is one that is... This is in the top 10 of my top 100, spoiler alert. It's going to happen, but this is in danger of being like top three or so. I am absolutely in love with this game since I finally... Like I said on the Nerd Shell video where it was like games that needed a second play. I had such a bad mm. teach of this from yeah. three of us. It took forever. Guy didn't know the rules that well. And I thought, there's a lot of me. There's a lot of this I'm liking. But man, this was long and it was clunky as all get out. Then nothing happened for years. And then eventually it came up again with some people at my Portsmouth Club who are more even fanatical about it than me. They play it way more on like higher difficulties than that. But they, I said, right, I trust you two to teach me this game because something tells me I'm missing out on something. And then as soon as we had that teach, it's like, yeah, boom. Bought it, done my videos on it, played it God knows how many times, usually true solo, but even multiplayer, I like it. I don't care that it's like two and a half, three hours long at times. I'm just enjoying every bit of this game. The puzzle mm -hmm. is good fun thematically yeah being the spirit and rising up against the invaders is already a thematic thing the cards as you said work you know casting the briny deep kills an yep. entire section of island tsunami does this sea monsters does that but for me the utmost like quintessential this is why this is like one of my number one uh, should it be my number one probably but it's those spirits the right. spirits say it all because every single one of them feels so different yep. i can never decide which one i want to play in any game but on top of that like here's one of my favorites here oceans hungry grass and that just mechanically how they work is so perfect so yeah. you know bring her a dream in darkness can't kill anyone but scares the living bejesus out of you yeah you know, the lightning strikes twice zaps things all over the shop builds up the energy and just blows up stuff oceans hungry grasp can't go inland has to be by the coast and it's mechanics of where its presence tokens is it goes in and then comes back out like a wave is yeah. every last detail of these spirits was thought of on a thematic level each one just you know serpent slumbering takes time to build up but it's gonna wake up uh the volcano builds up to you know build up fruition one of my favorites is a sharp fang behind the leaves because that character always reminds me of um the the it's not called the nothing it's his underling or whatever from never ending story the black wolf that turns up um i think it's like grok or grack or something but uh yeah that black wolf it reminds me of and i just like the idea of uh, sharp fangs going yeah i'm not doing a lot with your buildings but if one of your explorers gets out of line it's like um you know i just i'm just like i'm scaring you and i'm sending all the big cats after you is like mm -hmm. every spirit is so thematic <laughs> yeah and ah, just, I fell in love with this game. I cannot believe it took me years to finally discover that I really love this game. Well, my, my first play experience of this game went, went down in history. Um, there were four of us. Side note, never play this game with four players unless you're all very, very, very experienced. Um, yeah, and even then... Had maybe still don't play it with four players. So the four yeah. of us sat down to play this game for the first time, learning from the rule book with two players that had severe AP. Oh, God. Four, four hours later, we are about a third of the way through the game. And one of my oh. friends, Rage Quit, went home and we didn't see him for about a year because he'd never, he never wanted to come round again in case the other two people <laughs> were at the table and in the same game as him. It was friendship breaking, right? Now, that, ooh, I, 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 saw, that, but... I saw that there was a good game in there. Yeah. But do not play four players. You want to play <laughs> this two. Two players, not even three, when you start playing the game. Now, a lot yeah. of people play this solo. For me... The reason why Spirit Island is one of my favorite cooperative games of all time is the interaction between the players. You can yes. play it solo, absolutely. Mm. But I absolutely love the fact that I go, oh, wait a minute, Luke, don't you don't you have a card which can like deal one damage to all explorers in one particular area? Yeah, right. Well, I've got a card, and if I play this one, then I can move those into there, and then... You... I mean, I love cooperative games anyway, but the fact is... Cooperative Spirit Island isn't just two players playing the game with the same goal. It's two players who have to 
coordinate their efforts together, mm. you can play Spirit Island. I, I know one group that have said, oh, yeah, when we play Spirit Island four player, we just say, you do that bit of the board. I'll do that bit of the board. And, and I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, if that works for you, great. But it's it, so much better when you're coordinating your efforts and you're combining your powers together. That's, yeah, that's where that, the game's kicks. When you start off, you have got to, in a way, do that because you've obviously got to build up a little bit. But eventually yeah. you're going to suffer if you don't because your spirit may not be very good at doing with this. Like, Because yeah. when you've got more players, more stuff is happening. Therefore, you've got more things to deal with, particularly if you're on a higher difficulty. And mm -hmm. we had that the other day. Free player, I decided to play River. I used the, the sunshine aspect and I struggled a bit because I wasn't quite sure the best way to play it with that aspect. I thought, yeah probably would have preferred not to have used it but i wanted to try something different and eventually i got into my stride but i needed eventually for like who was next door to me uh what was he playing i forget somebody somebody was playing lure of the wilderness but that was on the other side i forget what oh he was doing a forbidden wilds character with all that right. and it's kind of like i kind of need you to just come over here a second because i kind of need a bit of assistance <laughs> over here and and some of these spirits do gel well with each other. I mean, I was helping yep. out lightning strikes on that one. I love playing. I don't tend to play two handed myself. I kind of prefer, um, you know, yeah, true solo if it's just me. But then I get I, into I the multi person. I want to do game. the commas. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's a it lot would going it on. would melt my brain. I struggle at two handing things at the best of times, um, but two handing this game, no, my brain would literally melt on the floor. Um, because there is so much to think about. There's so much going on. You need that. I mean, I know I know people who do multi-hand mm. this game, and they do fine, but I I, I couldn't do it. No, I, I need to. The, but, I mean, normally, this a lot of the games I've got would be like, all right, I play this solo because it takes too long multiplayer. Imperium yeah. is actually a very good example of this. I gave that a positive review and said, like, I like this deck builder a lot. But man, do I not want to play it with anybody but solo because it does take forever if yeah. it's not solo. So it's like, I've got the game, I've got the whole set and it's all blinged out and that, but it's my solo deck builder. Yeah. This is one of those where I know the game is very long. We did play a four player the other day. Three of us knew what we were doing. Well, no, three of us knew what we were doing and the other one yeah. was newish, but we were helping them along and it actually okay. didn't take that long. I mean, oh, because, right. okay. well... I'm familiar enough with it rules wise, even though I'm not an expert at the difficulties, but then the other two play this a lot. So oh, okay. they, they they really can coordinate and speed this game up if need be, even though one of them is a bit AP ish at times himself. But yeah. I think with Spirit Island he's quicker because he knows the game so well. But even though I know this is long with multiplayer, I don't shy away from it. Because I would right. normally with a lot of other games. If it's yeah. like, oh, you know, oh, we could play this game, it's like, oh yeah, but with four it takes so long. This one it's kinda like you know, oh, we're going to play this one three or four. And for a brief minute, I'll think, oh, that is long, but I've got the time. You know, and yeah. I'll instantly just it's jump worth it. into it. Hmm. I mean, going off at a tangent for a minute about, you know, this game being a thematic game is why this game is so good. Hmm. The, the flow of this game, you start off as this spirit who's just woken up and you're really weak. But yeah. also the invaders are quite weak because they're only on their deck number one. So it has this nice sort of balance to it. But at the start of the game, you're like, whoa, we're getting overrun. These invaders are popping up everywhere. There's no way. You start to get <laughs> overwhelmed. And you start to get the feeling of like, yeah, you're, you're being overwhelmed. Then you get to a point about a third to a half of the way through the game where you think, oh, actually, I've got, I've got some better cards now. And I'm, I'm getting more than two energy a turn. And oh, I'm, I'm managing to unlock some of my abilities. And you manage to fight the invaders back a bit. And you start to turn the corner. And then the invaders progress to deck two and suddenly you're like, oh no, they got really tough. Yeah. And you get this, <laughs> you get this nice flow. Now, if by sort of halfway through two thirds of the way through the game, you feel like you're being overwhelmed, you've lost at yeah. that point. You need, that uh, that's at the point you need to start rounding the corner and yeah. then you've got to finish it off and you've got to be very careful not to take your foot off the pedal near the end and let them spread in a little area. Um, it's just, it keeps you... It on the edge of your seat all the way through. Yeah, because a lot of the times we get on the difficulty, I think we've got no chance of winning this. And then we manage to pull it back. Granted, I'll admit yeah. the two people who know what they're doing are probably the main reason for that because I probably wouldn't figure out after the combos that they do. But still, we we pull it through every time I'm pessimistic about the chances of survival. And yeah. same from Greater Than Games, actually. Sentinels, the multiverse 
does this for me as well and a few of the other co-ops I really like it's that thing of you start off on the back foot you feel like you're overwhelmed but then eventually you get in your stride and you pull it back and that is so yep. fulfilling in a co-op it's not oh, God, punishing yes. you repeatedly for the entire game it's like a, yep. it's like you've got to just hang on until you get your stuff that you need and then it feels so good to pull it back and go right yeah. i'm in charge now yeah. <laughs> you know it's gonna and be there with spirit island compared to let's say robinson crusoe and let's say marvel champions marvel champions top 10 game for me absolutely love it but yeah. when i win a game of spirit island i feel i've done so on merit rather than oh we yeah. got a lucky run of cards yeah, yeah this because one, you, you... the amount of thought process, the amount of effort that you, the amount of mental energy you need to put into a game of Spirit Island, when you do win, you're like, yes, we did that because of those dozens and dozens of little micro decisions that we made, rather than the random element of you know dice or yeah. cards or anything like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean the event deck can sometimes have an effect on that, but even mm -hmm. then, it's still even if the event deck screws you over, it's still like yeah, but it was still fun up to that point. Yeah. Yeah, it's for example. Oh yeah, this is going to be like the Spirit Island show at this point. But yeah, it's like, it is. Yeah, I'd now just love it a bit. While we're talking about Spirit Island, let me just tell the audience what we agreed to do. We agreed that I would come on your show and do something, and that mm -hmm. you would come on my show and do something. This is obviously the first of that. We yeah. haven't yet arranged what we're going to do when you come on here. The chat is all yeah. asking for a Spirit Island playthrough with the two of us. They're, they're basically asking for us to just do like multiple yeah. flavors. Yeah. And I have the fine. app. Yeah. <laughs> I have the app. The app is great. It's true. So we so can as do in, a spirit... as, as, as in the Steam version. As in the Steam version. You does don't even do need it yourself. Yet? Does that do multiplayer? It does. It does, but you don't need it. Literally, I can, hmm. I can run the game yeah. on my machine. And because it's all open information. Yeah. And I've, I, I've already done this before. I did a stream when it first came out where I played two player Spirit Island with the app uh, and the other per I was just sharing my screen and they just told me what to do. So right. we can do that. Okay. I mean, yeah, that can work. I mean, I've got the actual app. I mean, I've got the app, the TTS. Well, we, we'll we'll, we'll do lot, proper so, multiplayer yeah. then. <laughs> I was going to so. say, we've because I mean, uh, I mean, if you've got, T yeah, you've got TDS and now you've tried that, the MJ and Iacona app or whatever it is, that particular workshop module or something for Spirit Island or something. And it's just like such a good... Right. Mod that handles it handles a lot of the, the the fiddly stuff for you in terms of like all right next phase yep. put things on or this effect happens but it even has like the ability to use like the number pad to spawn the various things okay so you don't so you don't have to click and drag all the explorers and that you can just put your mouse pointer over everything right. and just go number pad one explore and it just it just brings okay. it out for you it's a very good tts mod for it yeah and i think it, i'd probably it, prefer to use the app if that's if that's all right just because it's Your really choice. Nice. I, uh, it's Spirit Island at the end of the day. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we, me and Luke will speak afterwards, and we'll arrange a day when we're gonna we're gonna do that, um, mm. and we'll obviously let let everybody know. But yeah, two player Spirit yeah. Island using the app. Me and Luke. Definitely Sorted. gonna happen. Yep. And then once that does well, everybody will request more and more, and then we'll make it a monthly thing. Who knows? <laughs> so, what? Well, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Making plans already. Is it? You you gotta be there when we do it, though. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it won't work. But man, yeah, this say longest stream ever, and I don't care. It's like yeah, this is it was good. This this is why starting at eight was good because then otherwise it's it, I'd be I'd be I'd have been falling asleep by now. No, this I knew it would be <laughs> about two hours. Mm. Uh, I I knew it probably would be over two hours, but yeah, this has been great. Yeah. it's been it, it's been it's been good. I, I felt like it's like if I try something, we can make it too. But I felt then after a point, it's like we'd be rushing, and then it became yeah. clear like yeah, neither of us cared that it's going on long. And no. as and I'm looking at one gauge I have is like the live viewers thing, and it is continuous being being on like the 170, 180, 190, 200 mark. And the last time I ever got to that kind of level of people watching was when I first did a live stream. Okay, like, literally the first time I said I'm going to try a live stream. It has never been like triple digit level before then or something so like i say it's a grogan effect but <laughs> well you, you say that except that that number of live viewers is almost triple what i get so so clearly clearly they wanted to see our powers <laughs> combined into captain yeah. planet or something is that or whatever the somerset and uh, west country equivalent of that would be i guess they, they want to see us on more playthroughs and top 10 lists with a cider in each hand or something although i can't remember a actual thing actually cider yeah it's about the only thing I do drink. Ah, good. So, so we got that one. Thatcher's Haze. 
Yep. Good old Thatcher's. That's that's my tipple. All the works on that. But yep, everyone's loving it. So even even like New Zealand, yep, all the ones Excellent. coming in. All of that. But yeah, cheers for coming on. We're definitely gonna do more top tens in the future regardless. Top, top I mean, some we things. Yeah, we don't have <laughs> I mean I I mean like you wouldn't have to say like, oh uh, I agreed to do this one thing, you agree to do one thing. It's like there's no agreement about it, it's just say. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'd, I'd gladly have you on here, and I'm hopefully it's the other way around, but that's your yeah. choice. <laughs> So, yeah, thanks, everybody, for tuning into this. It's been amazing. Two, and four, two hours, 40 minutes of thematic Euros. All of them, well, most of them solid. That depends on personal <laughs> perspective. But <laughs> no, <you're> not. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Like, <laughs> <don't mind. laughs> but, yeah, nah, a lot of quality stuff on here. And I don't think many people were uh, getting across us with the uh, thematic side of it as well, or even the Euro definition. I think we managed to get away with that. But I'm sure we'll have plenty enough rule sets in the future. So... With that, yeah. we're going to sign off and talk more about the Spirit Island thing, which I'm sure you'll all look forward to. But thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time, okay? It's Cheers only everyone. a game, everyone, whether it's thematic or not. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs> Bye.